Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Township of North Dundas uh, Committee uh, Council, tonight being June 21st, 2022. Moved by John Thompson, seconded by Gary Annable, that the meeting of the Council of the Corporation of the Township of North Dundas be hereby called to order at 6 p.m. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Moved by Councillor Annable, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the agenda be approved as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? None. Seeing none. Moved by Councillor Annabel, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the minutes of the regular meetings of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held May 31st, 2022 be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. It's carried. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Annabel, that the minutes of the regular meetings of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held June 14, 2022 be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. That's carried. And tonight we have, um, I think, four delegations. And uh, the, our first delegation is uh, Mr. John Barrows from Next Energy Development Group, Inc. And it's about municipal sustainable infrastructure devel it's a development proposal. Mr. Barrows, if you'd come forward, please, and uh, take a seat. I just talk really low, but I'll talk louder. So next one. Um, so fundamentally, thank you very much for hearing us out and try to sell our option here. What uh, Next Energy is trying to do is we are a consulting group that uh, fundamentally, as a company with a lot of years of experience, we've gathered um, a network of people that have a lot of experience in building envelope in designing uh, renewable energy projects. And we now use that knowledge to help municipalities, <coughs> excuse me, and other smaller companies that weren't able to take advantage of the know-how that we've developed over many years and to try to help you move some of the green projects along that would otherwise have fallen by the wayside. So fundamentally, that's what we are as a company. We're Canadian. Um, we're not tied to any developer whatsoever. So we don't care. We're what we like to call technology agnostic. We don't. Um, we're not tied to one solar panel or one installer or one APC contractor. We just develop and we work for you. And we try to help you work within the framework of what our available grants and funding streams from the government. Um, obviously, I have certified energy managers and auditors on staff that are that conduct these studies and are, we design, engineer, and build the whole project for you. If we could have the next slide, please. So that's basically who we are, what we do. We do, our experience has been l largely with banks. So we tell banks when somebody comes in to buy something, we tell them whether the project is valid or not, and we do the due diligence on it, right? So we've taken that. We do the feasibility studies. We design and engineer a system that is optimized to meet your particular needs. So we don't just say, here's how much roof space you got. This is what you need. No, we design it exactly all the steps of the way, always in uh, conjunction with what you guys need to do and what your needs are, and we try <coughs> to do it as um, 
we arrange financing, we do construction engineering, we do, we get the tender ready project ready for you, then it's put out for bid, right? And you guys accept whatever bid you want, but we don't, and then we do the construction manager, we act as uh, management, we act as the owner's rep, so we ensure that whoever it is that comes in to build it, everything is built according to specifications. So, funding opportunities. This is how we came across and how we were presented to, to your mayor and Angela. So in working with South Stormont, um, Mayor McGillis decided that it would be interesting if uh, other municipalities took advantage of it. So there's a bunch of funding streams that are available through both the federal government, Infrastructure Canada, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, okay? so. Let's start, if we can have the next one, please. So we'll start with the community building retrofit, okay? Um, the community building retrofit is a funding stream that is really set up for a study, okay? So what the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities does is they will pay up to 80% of the cost of a feasibility study to find what is called a greenhouse gas reduction pathway. So, the study will identify how you as a municipality, with whatever m buildings you select, they have to be community buildings, but they can also be fire halls, they can be police stations, they can be whatever. That study, as long as it includes one community building, can include other buildings, uh, health centers, whatever. So we can do optimize. What that, what the study will allow us to do is I, we have to, at the end of it, be able to identify two paths, so two roadmaps, to which you would be able to, over a 20-year period of time, reduce your carbon footprint by 20%, by 80%, and in 10 years by 50%. That said, it's gonna sound a little contradictory, but it's non-committal, which means the study is the study. I will show you the path. I can lead you to water. I don't have to make you drink it, okay? You can quit at any time. It is just the study is essential for future funding for anything you do. What it does is an internal audit, and what we're trying to do is teach you how to do or help you do more with less. So. It's not enough to meet, to reduce your energy uh, consumption by just putting uh, renewable energy and offsetting consumption from the grid. The idea is to reduce the amount of energy that you use in the long run, take that money and put it back into the community and use it for other things, okay? So we identify that, eligible buildings up there are indoor ice rinks, sports arena, anything fundamentally that's a community center. Um, if we could have the next one. So that's what the, the feasibility study does. What you will get out of that is you will get a Nash Ray, which is a very um, in-depth analysis of all of your technology that you use. Let's take an arena, for example. We will look at your Zambonis, we will look at your heating system, we will look at your lighting system, we will look at your building envelope, we will look at your insulation, we will look at the structure. Um, if we need a new roof, we'll put in a new roof, it's eligible. We'll, we'll put a low emissivity ceiling. We can do, we just have to identify how you do it. And it doesn't matter, even if you had to buy carbon credits, I just have to say, here is a path by which you would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. That's what this one is trying to do. At the end, I submit this. If, uh, can we have the next slide? If um, you can either now go, if you decide at the end of this period, let's say I identify lighting, I identify heating that we are gonna take from uh, natural gas and put it into electric, and because we put a solar array, it's internal con uh, consumption. If I do that, you can, at the end of this study, you can actually apply to the, uh, the GHG reduction pathway as a capital project, in which case they will give you 25%, up to $5 million, 25%. So 
let's not get confused. The 80% was for the study, okay? Um, you, it's a maximum of 60, uh, their contribution is maximum of 65,000 per building, up to 200,000 in a total envelope, okay? Your contribution is 20%. Even your 20%, I can get back through other funding streams, okay? So it, the, the cost to you is very negligible, besides you would make it all back up. If you decide to go ahead, this is from this community building retrofit, not the green and inclusive community buildings. From this one alone, funding is quite is quite vast and it's, it's readily available for this one. It's not, you're not running up against anything. What you would be able to do is you will, as long as you, imp if you're going to institute and we identify a few of these uh, greenhouse gas saving measures, they will pay up to 25% as a grant and give you the remainder as a low interest rate that municipalities would get. Further to that, you can get other grants and stack them. So it doesn't, the more grants you get, they're not mutually exclusive. They can be added on and be compounded for future funding. Next slide, please. Um, there is another funding stream. So if we, at the end of this study, always still within the CBR, okay, the community building retrofit, this is retrofit. You could either do the GHG reduction pathway, so we identify how we would reduce in 50% in 10 years, 80% over 20. You could say, okay, we'll look at the Zambonis, we got a grant for the Zambonis, we're gonna do the rest over the 20 years, you're not committed to doing it, your grant comes in irrespective of that. It's just a pathway, it's like a road map, so that the municipality has it, and if you wanted tomorrow to identify where you could save energy and where you could reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, that's the study that would be used for all future funding. And it is essential that you do the study in order to get this. You won't get the grants without the study. Now, you could say, look, we don't want to do this GHG reduction pathway. We just want we just want one quick fix and we're done with you guys. Okay. They'll do a 30% reduction in energy, right? One off. Reduce show me that you can reduce energy consumption by 30%, which is pretty easy. They'll come in, they'll allow up to 80% of the grants, up to 80% of the $5 million. They'll, once again, 25% as a grant, right? The rest is a low interest loan. Can be, once again, can be compounded with others and so forth, right? Is, we're, are we getting it more or less, or mm -hmm. am I going too fast? So, <laughs> so next slide, please. So that is from here. Now, Infrastructure Canada, also has a few other for, uh, grants available for the same energy audits and energy facilities. They'll give you up to 50% of the cost. They won't cover the, total, the totality of the cost, but these are more geared from Infrastructure Canada. So mm -hmm. let's say we had a water filtration plant, a pumping station, a sewer treatment plant. Those are eligible up to 175,000 per building. And once again, to identify measures that would allow you to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a lot of municipalities use this particular one, especially for waste treatment plants and so forth, because you can do a significant um, energy reduction. Um, part of the costs, but as you can see from up there, so you don't need to, to have the same, you don't need to reach the same level of targets, right? Because it's more geared towards uh, infrastructure. But once again, five million and the rest goes on. Next slide. Um, this is the green, in, the GICB, the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Fund. So this is the one that is the most attractive right now. Um, whereas the other one tries to reduce um, carbon offset, the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Fund seeks energy reduction and greater inclusiveness. So accessibility becomes a determining factor in obtaining the grant. You, you, I would, for this one, you would need an accessibility study. You would always do that. Um, this grant will pay 80%, okay, of total expenses. 
right? So you're only left with 20%. And if we're going to have the next step, uh, right. So how much funding is available? It's a 1.5 billion. It started last year. This is the one that uh, South Stormont is using to replace the roof on their arena. So if we could, um, it, once again, it, it's a small, uh, they, they're divided into various categories. Um, there's one error there that says uh, 250,000, and that is that should be the minimum. So the minimum for our projects is 250,000 up to 25 million. They also cover new builds. It, can't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a retrofit. And what you have to show on this is a 30% energy savings, which is relatively easy. And normally you just go in and put some solar panels, do some insulation, replace roofs. And this one pays, so if we could have the next slide, it'll show you the minimum eligibility requirements you obviously, as long as the property is owned by the municipality, as long as it's a, it has access to the public, then it will qualify for the GICB funding. Right, next. Um, so this is the minimum eligibility requirements. It doesn't really, we don't, it just means that in a new building, let's say we're going to put up a new building, it has to conform to all the latest energy saving. You can't just build a box, right? It has to conform. It also means that um, if we could have the next slide, I'll put it in. So the eligible buildings are anything like this. It's most suited to arenas um, and um, libraries, schools, um, anything that's public access, right? Um, the interesting thing about this one, if we could have the next slide, I'm just trying to rush through it so you'll have more time to, <laughs> to ask questions. Um, so the retrofits include, and that's what's very interesting about this one, is uh, lighting systems, the whole building envelope, so your total install insulation and so forth of the building, um, HVAC equipment, um, solar PV array, um, if you were going to put it on the roof, and the rest. To give you an idea, if you were to substitute a roof, and let's say that your roof is um, even, okay, and I can mention your specific case. Structural upgrades, right, to accommodate the extra weight or whatever, yes, they're included. Uh, a new roof, yes, it's included. So if, you've, if you're going to spend a million bucks on a roof that you would pay otherwise, if you go in and put a solar array on your roof, you'll n look, the solar array and a roof will cost you about 350, 400,000, your contribution. So it's much cheaper than putting up, even, it's a fraction of the cost of the roof. And the whole idea, once again, is to try to get communities to reduce their energy costs. And the pre-feasibility we did for South Stormont, and I'm sorry, I, I'm using somebody else's, but their energy bill just for the arena was around 105,000 a year. And with the PV array that we designed to put up, they will save um, 90,000 a year, and their total cost with a roof and everything, their contribution is about $275,000, right? Whereas they would have paid close to 600,000 for a new roof, mm -hmm. right? So just there, you get, um, and while you're at it, change your lighting system, change the rest, because what the idea here is to do, once again, more with less. So. You have the same, if you could, if you want to reduce more carbon, s switch over from natural gas to electric, now you're generating your own electricity. It's a huge cost savings in the long run because we often forget, and I'm not saying that you do, but we often forget that we put up a building, but the, that's just the initial cost. It's the operation and maintenance of, of the system going forward. And that's what this is going to allow you to do, both the CBR and the GICB, the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Program, what they'll allow you to do is dramatically, and I do mean dramatically, lower your operating costs associated with energy, which is the bulk of your costs, right? Either through better insulation, more efficient returns. And, and that's what this whole program is about. So it's not just about 
giving communities money. It's about making sure that that money has a long-term sustainable impact and helps you to do that. To do that, they do require that you do the, the GHG pathway fe uh, feasibility study, and it has to be done um, by qualified people because that's what they want you to do is to identify. Um, this does not need to be tendered. It is an open contract and the government accepts it. When we do submit our application, they're the ones who vet the budget. We put a budget, a project timeline, we submit all that to them and they approve it or not. So the government does that for you. And the reason being, it's not like putting out an RFQ or an RFP for, for an installation, this is a study, right? So they want to make sure that the people doing the study are going to be as accurate as possible. We can have the next slide. So basically, the overview, you can use the, uh, the, inter the, the objective is to use the community building retrofit program. The study allows you, okay, if you were just going to do the GICB, the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Fund will give you that money, but you've got to front all of your studies. So in order to be eligible and to get a chance, you must have at least a class B plus, which is a ready engineer, fully designed project, ready to be tendered. If you do that, you'll get, a, you'll get the grant. If you don't do that, you're gonna wait years, okay? And if you ever get it, you get put to the back of the line because you're not ready. What CBR, and, and that's what I mentioned to the mayor, was that what CBR allows you and encourages you to do is when you're doing this energy audit, it also asks us to do a full inventory of all grants available in all studies. Of course, I'm going to see the GICB because we already know it exists and go ahead and use that money, part of our funding, to go ahead and, because that's one of the ways that we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So by all means, go ahead and use that money to prepare the GICB application. Once your GICB application is guaranteed, uh, is accepted within after three to four months of submission, if accepted, they'll give you 250,000 upfront, right as a first time payment before you've even started construction. And that is to pay for what you would have incurred for developing the project, right? But because you did it through GICB, you get those 250,000, you, you can use them for interconnection studies and for anything else you might need. So the idea is to use the CBR, uh, community Building Retrofit f Pathway, uh, GHG Pathway Reduction Feasibility Plan. Sorry, it's a lot of words and a lot of acronyms. To get that study to pay for, to prepare, to do an energy audit, to tell you exactly and identify how you would, a path for you to reduce your, your greenhouse gas emissions and reduce your energy consumption. Apply to the GICB, and as a fallback position, you would have, sorry, I'm looking at the clock, you would have both, you would have a, a GICB application, but you would also have a CBR capital projects or uh, Greenway um, GHG reduction pathway study. You can actually stack the two. So even if you get the GICB, of the 20% that you have to come up with with the GICB, you can use the CBR contribution to help you offset that. So looking at the project, and that's what we do as consultants, is we work with you at every step of the way. It's important that you keep in mind that when we do an audit, we identify, we present the council a path, we work with your CAO or whoever your department heads are. You make a decision on which items you want to move forward with, which you don't want to move forward with, if any at all. We apply, we do everything for you. So you don't, we do the applications, we, we do everything for you. And I think that that's it. Um, the next slide is one last one. Um, this is just a development timeline. It takes about f four to six months. 
Um, the CBR application takes a, takes us to get an answer back and to give you to go ahead takes us two weeks. Um, I was just telling Angela, ours we submitted ours. Last one we submitted was on a Tuesday. By Friday, we had a response that we're ready to go and they were approved. If they know you, and then of the eighty percent that they're going to pay, they're only going to give you that money at the end of the submission of the study. But so you have to, as a council, move forward and say yes, we're okaying this study. You will front it when we make the application within the first week or two. We also ask for an early deferment. So what they'll do is they'll give you, of the 80% that they're going to give you when the study's done, they'll give you 70% of that 80% up front within a month or so. Like, they'll, they'll give it to you. They know us, so they'll, it, it's just a, until they vet who's doing the study and if the structure and the, the project um, structure and the funding is correct. Because we've done them before, they just work and they'll just give it to you. So there's minimal um, cash being uh, spent by you guys. And I think that's our last slide. And thank you. That's it. Well, thank you, John. Um, I know the first time I, uh, it was brought to my attention, as you mentioned, Mayor McGillis, it was uh, intriguing. And uh, we were looking at uh, some projects we have in front of us uh, in, uh, in the townships and involving big capital. And so it was intriguing at that time, and then I, uh, Angela, our CAO, and, I, and myself, we had the opportunity to meet and visit and talk about these things. And uh, and uh, the next step is that you're here tonight presenting to the rest of uh, rest of council. And uh, I see notes have been taken, and uh, I'm sure we have some questions and comments. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, John, for the presentation. It's interesting. It's always exciting. Uh, the, the one thing that, or one thing that stuck out is when you talk about learning how to do more with less as a lower tier municipality. We've been doing more with less for the last 28 years or so, but uh, it's nice to get some different revenues of, of, of or different streams of revenue. The one thing um, that I didn't see or hear uh, that, uh, that perhaps you could uh, explain to us a little bit is what your fee structure is. Oh, so is okay. even on a typical generic, say a million dollar project or just doing the study or like so, what sort of? So, the study is the study. The right. fees are set sort of by the government. So it's um, usually around, uh, for depending on, on obviously the building, right? right. Uh, a typical arena is around 80,000. Okay. okay. A typical arena. Um, and that includes, okay, and I'm saying that because it includes the GICB, okay, filling out the full engineering, structural, everything for the GICB as well, right? Um, if there wasn't a GICB, it would be different. It would just be an energy audit, right? Um, so it, it varies, but it, um, yeah, it, it's basically paid for by the, it's the structure that the government yeah. puts out. Okay. So it's not more or less, it's, and that's why they don't exactly. require it to be tendered. It's because they've kind of told you how much you have to play with and that's about it. And that's, you can't really get beyond that. You can, but then, once again, you have to decide how many buildings you want to include. So the maximum that they'll contribute to is a total of 200,000. So that, that I could charge on that 240. Anything I charged above that would be, um, would have to be paid by you. You can get it back. Um, if, the, if you moved ahead with the GICB, the Green and Inclusive Community for that 80% grant, then that one, um, okay, so what we're doing is we're using the cover of a grant, of, of a study, to develop the project. I hope you understand that. Uh, yeah. The actual development fees are perfectly eligible for both if I was to do a capital project or if I do the GICB. That's where the GICB comes in and gives you 250,000 once they accept your application and it's got legs to, to go forward. They'll give you that. What we're doing is we're using the maximum allowed within the study to prepare all that because the problem becomes you either it's to try to save you money so that you don't have to lay out as much because otherwise 
what will happen is you would end up, if it was a normal structure, yeah, you'd go out and spend 250000 If your project gets uh, approved and if it goes ahead, yes, you'll get that back for development fees. What we're saying is with doing the audit, identifying the measures and the possibilities and the streams, uh, the pathways by which you'll be able to reduce your, your carbon emissions and reduce your energy costs, we will also prepare those studies and prepare that submission. Thank you. Okay, so it's a much more, sorry, uh, complete, if you will. Thank you, John, uh, and, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Thompson. No, uh, when you had said there, um, and then if you're approved, so when you, if your company was coming in to do this, uh, to do an audit, and we were wanting uh, a quote or an estimate on it, uh, on what the cost would be towards us if we don't know if we're going to be going uh, going ahead with a project. Is there any guarantee on your company's side? Like you said, usually you'll have approval within a week. Yes. Is there any guarantee to the township, uh, the work you put in initially? Right. If, uh, if it was rejected, if we did not, what would the fee be to the township? If, uh, if for some reason your study wasn't accepted or your recommendation wasn't accepted, what would the cost be to the municipality? Zero. It, there's no cost if, no. Uh, if it doesn't go through. No, so how this actually works is um, you tell me we, we, if you allow us to go ahead, you put together a portfolio of the buildings that we will then decide which ones you want to look at. I make that proposal and that submission to CBR for the study they get back to me and say within a week and tell me that the buildings are eligible or not eligible, that the municipality is eligible and not eligible. That's the fir first phase, the eligibility. Within the second week, it usually takes a week too, they'll come in and say, okay, John, now you've got two weeks to come up and show me what your project, um, it, we call it a project workbook. It, you know, MS project, you say what I'm gonna do, how long it's gonna take who's gonna do what, I have to put together a project plan. Once I do that, I send it in, they come back and give me a number, an application number. Once they give you an application number, that is their confirmation that you will get paid for the study. Okay, so you, I do not charge you anything. Zip, zero, zip. If it's not successful, there's I don't no charge you anything until I, I, you get an approval from the government that my study will be paid for. Okay. And that it conforms to all the requirements and needs. No, there is zero, there's zero risk for you in that, in that regard. Um, I can't guarantee that, um, I can't guarantee that the GICB application will be accepted or not. Um, what I can tell you is that we do it very thoroughly and obviously that's what we strive to do and if we didn't do like okay we're vetted by the government that's why it's not a necessarily a competitive process they they know you they'll say yeah you can do it you've done it before you know what you're doing you're good to go ahead no you don't have the qualified people and you don't so once they you see the company that it is, you say how you're gonna do it and how long it's gonna take you and you say what you're gonna spend. And I have to say what I charged you. Like I have to show them, put on all the invoices, you will then, who the CAO or whoever goes, has to, because you're the primary applicant, you're the one who's receiving the money, not me. Okay, um, I'm just your consultant yes. to do the work. Yeah, and what my question was was, if, as the consultant, I was wondering if there was a fee, if for some reason it was not accepted. Right, we never, but, uh, we until, never, until, we don't charge. Until it's accepted and, we don't uh, charge and approved, you. there's yeah. no charge. Um, they allow you to charge, this is so no scammer. They actually allow you to charge up to $1,000 before you actually get approved. But we don't charge anything. We take that on, uh, no. So there's no, there's zero risk to you. To the, to the study part. Okay, thank you. Further questions from uh, Councillor Bergeron. Uh, my question has to do with the solar panels. Yes. Are they going through a net meter, yes. a net meter to the grid? 
Count, uh, excuse me, Council Bergeron. Sorry. Yeah, I, move your mic. It's a little bit closer. Please. A net meter meaning yes, after producing yes, yes. power, it goes to the grid, and if we need power, then from the grid it goes into the building, or will there have to be a stack of batteries? So it depends on how you want it designed. Um, yes, okay, because of the building. If we're talking on an arena, yes. If we're talking at the municipal offices, not necessarily, because your time of, so your load curve, when you use the power, coincides more or less when, when you're generating with it. You don't really use much energy during the uh, evening hours, but you use the bulk of it during the day. Okay, what happens in an arena, for instance, is that you use a lot of energy but you use it in the winter when the solar panels produce less. Okay. So, and you also use it in the evening in the morning hours when we're not, when the solar panels don't produce as much. That said, if I could, this, solar panels are a very strong component of this, but they're not the whole thing, right? Like, uh, as a matter of fact, certain funding streams, um, for instance, if, uh, Infrastructure Canada mandates that I can't reduce more than 30% of the energy just by solar panels alone. They don't wanna let you make it out easy. They want you to identify other ways of reducing your energy consumptions, right? So, but yes, so in this case, yes, it is on a net metering. Um, what happens in net metering, if I may explain to you real quick, is now they allow you to do it on an annual basis. It used to be every month, right, that you would zero out your balance. Now you're allowed to carry it over for a full year so that means that we can bank electric, uh, photo, uh, electrons in the summer and use them in the winter. That said, how that works is you're exchanging kilowatts of energy, electrons. You're not exchanging delivery fees, processing, billing, and all of that. So there's a big difference there, right? So. Energy may cost you 11 cents, but you look at your bill and it's 18, 20, 22, depending on your household. The rest is distribution um, and all the other related charges. What we're allowed to do, and that's what we do. So now we look at your bill when you use the power. We match, it's actually quite an interesting way. We match all that up and then we say, okay, I'm sending so many kilowatts out and I'm bringing so many in, but that doesn't help me reduce consumption totally because I'm still bringing in, and now I'm allowed to generate a little bit more than I consume. They won't give you money for it, but they'll allow you to use that extra energy to offset some of your distribution and regulatory charges. So we can narrow that gap. In some cases, in South Stormont, for instance, we put in a 500 kilowatt battery. And the reason we did that is because now we're able, okay, so to keep it simple, if I'm buying electricity from the grid 11 cents, if my solar array is generating at 6 cents, 7 cents a kilowatt hour, I have a vested interest to use as much of my own power as possible because it's coming in cheaper than, although I'm shipping it back and forth, my levelized cost of energy, so the capital cost of installing something over the lifetime divided by how much it's gonna produce, that's your levelized cost of energy. If I have energy at six cents from my roof, why would I be buying it from the grid? So by using a battery pack, I'm allowed to store it, shave off, and more importantly, there are various prof components to an energy bill. There's peak demand, and there's hourly charges. So I'm able to lower my peaks because I now, when I have a big draw and the chillers come on and I'm using the case of an arena, I'll back it up with my battery power so now I never have those peak loads, right? So the short answer, yes, it will definitely be on net metering. How that's gonna work, I can only tell you that what's optimal for you once I do an in-depth analysis and see how you're going to do, see how if we're going to use, for instance, if we went off uh, uh, gas heating and went onto electricity, see how your chillers, if maybe we can, we can organize them a little bit better. How do we shave, how do we, we do a study for you to show you how you are going to be the most efficient possible.
right? So at a certain level of batteries, you will also get, in this case, you could use this as a community shelter because GICB wants that. They want climate resilience. So if we can say that we have a 12-hour, 24-hour emergency shelter for the community, it gives you extra bonus points towards you getting approved. Okay, yep. so what we're, our study will do is give you the maximum allowable points for you to be approved, and it allows you always the choice of what do you do. Thank you. Councilor um, Annabel. Uh, I'm wondering if we get to a construction stage of mm -hmm. doing insulation, upgrading, wiring, all of all of that, does the township still have some control as to whether that's done locally or are there, or do Absolutely. You, so it, it's our choice. I'm just your consultant. Okay. Okay, I work for you. I'm, I'm just a bridge between the funding streams. I give you the legitimacy to be able to take advantage, if you will, of the funding streams. Does that make sense? Like, yep. without the study, you won't get them. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, at every stage, I do not contract anything out. I do not, I am not married to any technology. I work for you. Okay. The RFPs are put out by you, and they're accepted by you. I have no say over who you take. Okay. Councillor Thompson. Uh, in your study, it'll also, <laughs> will let us know for, um, like the savings from the, uh, from solar panels. Uh, the life expectancy and over time as they drop in their efficiency yes and uh disposal disposal yep. fees and what is required and responsibilities for disposal yes everything Just so we know any future any future costs if we did go right. ahead with it. so all technologies i'm sorry that was I, I i didn't go into it because it's quite complex it's actually i mean if you're going to go just the ashray level two that's just the requirements. I can give you that. That's what a, a NASHRAE level two you need to do. On the other ones, they're really quite extensive. So, no, we have to do a full life cycle cost evaluation of everything we propose. We actually do one of everything you have now. So we start by doing a, an audit, and that audit gives you your baseline, where you are now, right? What's your life cycle? What's the life expectancy of the equipment you have? What is the operating cost of that? And then we put in everything we suggest always has a life cycle cost included, including disposal. So it's installation, operations and maintenance, and disposal. It's a full life cycle cost. Okay. And is there uh, uh, any contracts that are signed if you did go to uh, uh, solar panels, if, say, if it was a 15, 20 year life, are you committed to when it's done, say the life of the panels is um, is over, are you committed because you got the grant money to do it? Do you have to um, reinstall and, uh, and, and keep the system up and going once it's done the life cycle? Right, so um, I don't get the grant money, you do. Okay. The, the municipality does. Yeah, so just, no, 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 I understand. Municipality yes. responsible. Uh, no. So, Part of that is um, w when we, we tender out uh, for the EPC, we put out an RFQ, right? We're going to actually do the R if you do it, we will do an RFQ prior to that to get all uh, uh, quotes, get in construction dates, because that's the only way you're going to get a firm uh, bit, uh, uh, you know, quote. Um, with that, so part of the life cycle costs, like I was trying to explain, actually include operations and maintenance, disposal, and everything. So there is also a contract with a company of your choosing to provide operations and maintenance for the, pro for the solar array throughout the life. That's your contract. Obviously, you can call me if you have a problem and get it back, but it's your job. It's, it's your contract. Like. Uh, I just make sure that everything's done according to specifications, but the operations and maintenance is with you. Like you will, I will obviously itemize that and account for that. That I would never make a cost without that, right? So yeah. the cost benefit, uh, it, I will show you that if um, 
if we were to use a solar pan uh, and a battery and a solar panels, then we would reduce our consumption by reducing uh, um, your peak demand. You will now go into a different rate category, right? A totally different rate structure with Hydro One. How would that work? I negotiate with Hydro One. I, I'm the one who gets the interconnection agreements. I'm the one who makes sure that I make sure it works. But you have the decision on who you contract. So if you would feel more comfortable with one company that may charge more than the other, you say, but John, I want to do that. And we say, okay, we put that price in and this is how it'll look in the long run. It's very simple. Yep. And uh, so there's no commitment once at the end of life. It's up to, it would be up to the council of the day if they wanted to, uh, like when the life when the lifespan is done, it's twenty five years. It's so twenty five years. So at twenty five years, there would be the cost to redo the uh, panels. That would be an option for yes. council of the day. There's no commitment that you have to. Uh, no. Okay. Um, what you could do is you could do in in um, operations at O and M, right? In the operations and maintenance, you could put a. I mean, they're obviously going to be signed five year contracts for every five years and you could go at the fifth year and we could put in, okay, do you want to dismantle optional cost of taking the system off the roof? Bear in mind, the racks are aluminum, right? The racking system, There's, they don't actually go through the roof, they fasten onto uh, the risers of the roof. So they actually save the roof. And, and that's one of the reasons that we're allowed to do it. So. If I look into a, a roof, I'm going to recommend that, let's say you're 20 years into a roof and the roof has a 40-year life cycle, I'm gonna recommend that you substitute the roof or not, depending on what size it is or what you want to do, whatever is benefit, because I work for you. If you want to substitute the roof, and we put it in and we add it on as a cost. Yeah. Okay, no, I was just wondering no, if no, no. any future financial commitments that we'd have to be looking no, at. No, uh, but, but, but it, it is a very valuable question, yes. Uh, it, it's just that we would item, we would account for that. We would we budget for that. So it, it's, a, it's like buying a car but also putting in an allowance for operations and maintenance, wear and tear and fuel for it. Like we have to account for, that's what the full life cycle cost of anything is, right? Okay, <clears throat> uh, fellow councillors, I think it, uh, we've had lots of opportunity to ask questions. Uh, I'm sure there's more questions to be asked. We have three other delegations here tonight. I, uh, I want to thank uh, John, uh, Mr. Barrows, for his presentation. Uh, obviously, generated a lot of interest and a lot of, a lot of discussion. I'm sure there's more to be had. So I think uh, I'm, I'm asking, I'm sure there's an opportunity for us to forward some questions that weren't asked this evening. Of course. As they come up. and. Uh, and I want to uh, thank you for being here tonight. Not a problem. And then if you just decide whether you decide to go ahead or not, and next steps, if you decide to go ahead, is decide which buildings you want to work on, and then we prepare a budget. Okay. Then we submit, and then, then we know what we're up against. But those are the high limits, right? You can't exceed yeah. okay. uh, 80,000 per, per building. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so very much. much. Thank you, John. Uh, Have a good night. Have a safe trip. Excuse me, uh, Madam Clerk, is, uh, is uh, Ms. Blanchard available? If she's not, that's fine. We can, uh, we'll skip ahead. I do believe we can get... Um... No, it's okay, John. I'm just going to move right ahead to Mr. Smurl. He's here. Thank you. Mr. Smurl, please come ahead. much, Mr. Mayor and uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, councillors all, and staff. I'm pleased to be able to give you a quick update tonight, and I think in three or four minutes I can probably review what I've sent forward. I've got a couple of comments I'd like to add, and I'd like one minute at the end to say a few words about the Cenotaph Committee. All Please right. go ahead. So you have my report in front of you. The first, number one, is just straight information. Number two, 
I wanted you to have an idea of how many committees there are, and there are six active committees, five standing and one that meets twice a year. The other committees meet four times a year, and I've represented the executive and now council on each of those committees until the end of this current term. I've mentioned forestry, and the tree prices are going to go up to beat heck next year, so be ready for that and be knowing about that, and it, it's going to be a, a fact. Uh, the Clean Water Committee, I wanted to let you know how much water, how much dollars they put into water projects like milk house runoff, like milk house water, like uh, barnyard runoff, like closing wells, etc. And in, in the last meeting, they approved $36,593 worth of grants going out. And that's going to be interesting, and I'll comment at the end, because uh, with the minister's change and the Conservation Act changes, there are now three categories of how dollars can be, sent, be spent. One, two, and three. And uh, one is pretty straightforward, but when you get to two and three, there have to be partnerships developed, and there have to be individual agreements made out with the municipalities on what projects will go forward and what won't. I added that fish and wildlife, and I wanted to mention there's the healing place that's in uh, First Nation uh, uh, development that's near Shanley, and I mention it because North Dundas High School students spent a day there a couple of weeks ago preparing the garden for planting that they're going to do. They had done some studying in this area, and they volunteered and went and spent the day there working at the gardens at the uh, healing place. Uh, communications are straightforward, and I wanted to mention when we talk about communications, the fish camps, there are six this year, and two of them are at Cass Bridge. So South Dun North Dundas is doing very well in that area. And the Leitrim Wetlands Committee is an interesting committee in that it, they meet um, twice a year, but there are uh, pr representatives from, as noted, the Tartan Homes, the Council in Ottawa, um, the SNCA, obviously, the NCC, the ministry, with real good community reps. So it's quite a good discussion each time that's there. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the planning departments, and that's just for your information, and that's not different from what you're, what you're facing. Uh, it's interesting in number four, there, the South Nation is adding two other municipalities for doing the sewage contracts, and they're individual contracts with each municipality, and the information is there. Um, I mentioned number five, and the Ministry of the Environment has noted there will be progress reports from SNCA and every other conservation authority across the province, and the first one goes in July 1st, and each of these is a progress report on how we're doing at completing the direction the Ministry has said thou shalt move forward with. And um, the first report was approved by the board and was sent in at the, uh, well, for July 1st at our last meeting. And I wanted to mention as well that I'm not sure if you know that we still have a source water protection committee in our area. You'll remember a couple of years ago after Walkerton, there was a great deal of uh, work done on source water protection, and you were involved and all of our municipalities were involved. Well, that committee is still active. It's a ministry committee, but it's centered at uh, Raisin River, and it's for Raisin and South Nation, and the official group that looks after it, if you like, is South Nation and Raisin. So twice a year, South Nation has a meeting that's dedicated to the Clean Water, uh, or the Source Water Protection Committee and Clean Water, and that meeting was held a couple of months ago as well. So that's a very quick overview of what's happening there. I wanted to just say quickly that uh, we're moving ahead well with our Meet Me on Main Street rededication, dedication of the new parts to the cenotaph and the rededication of the older parts to the cenotaph. And that's going to be a very crisp 25 minutes from 6 till 6.25 of the Morwood and Meet Me Main Street evening. And we've made arrangements with the band to take their break during that time so that uh, we, we will have our own PA system, we'll have our own everything. We will have military involvement, we will have um, a uh, color party, we will have a piper, and there will be a march down, and then the dedication, rededication, ended by a brief prayer, and of course, O Canada will start it, and, uh, and uh, the Royal Anthem will end it. So that's a very quick overview of 
the CRISP program we're going to have, but we think it's a very important program, and we think it's very important to our community. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you have questions on any of the things I've quickly gone over, let me know. And if you wish additional information on anything I've said, I have it. And I can either send it to you in writing or else. Well, thank you, Mr. Sparrow. I'm sure we'll have a conversation in the very, very near future about uh, some of the items that you discussed today. But I do open it up to uh, fellow members of council for questions, comments. July 6 promises to be an exciting day. And the staff here have guaranteed good weather. <laughs> no, you can count on staff. Thank you, Mr. Smurl. Thank you. Um, and um, our next delegation, if I could ask um, Mary Cook. I do remember Mary from, now I recognize Mary. Welcome, Mary. Mary's here representing uh, as one of the members of the Hallville Citizens Committee. Good evening, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor and Councillors and staff. Thank you, Mayor Frazier, for giving us this opportunity to formally present our community's concerns at tonight's council meeting. My name is Mary Cook, and I have been a resident of Hallville since 1986. I have been asked to speak tonight on behalf of the residents of our community. We have two main concerns to address council. I will address our first concern with a brief history of the issue. Your Worship, the residents of Hallville have been patiently awaiting a promised new community park since 1999 when land was purchased at part of Lot 7, Concession 9, by the newly amalgamated township. During this time, Hallville had a very active and dedicated volunteer recreation committee that raised money towards this park over many years from the 1990s to 2007. These various volunteer committees were responsible for the famous Hallville chicken barbecue every summer, the last of which sold over 800 chicken meals. The barbecues also provided dancing and many activities for our children. A yearly hockey tournament was organized and brought teams from across eastern Ontario to our beloved outdoor rink, a rink that had its boards built by local residents. It was the pride of our community. Hallville also became famous for its annual winter carnivals. On the ice surface, we had skating races, chili contests in the canteen, and there were sleigh rides for our children. It was in the late 1990s when the Recreation Committee attended a council meeting much like we are doing tonight. It has been 23 years, Your Worship, and the discussion tonight is unfortunately still the same. The long-awaited Hallville Community Park. We are still waiting on its development to start. At the council meeting in 1999, a local resident, Gary Reif, provided council with two professional architectural drawings drafted free of charge on proposed plans for this land. We waited. In 2008, the township erected a wooden sign on this property visible from County Road Number 1, Hallville Community Park. This sign is still sitting on the empty field today, deteriorated to the point that part of it has rotted off. In 2018, the township took down our only park in Hallville that was on St. John Street. Our children have had nowhere to play since. The township then sold this property in 2021. Our community outdoor rink, once our pride and joy, has been left in disrepair for years. Over all these years, 23 years, our residents have been left to watch other communities in North Dundas receive funding for new parks, various upgrades to existing parks, and new upgrades to their re recreation facilities. Your Worship, we know you are aware of the construction boom happening in Hallville over the last several years. Ian Drew's development in 2013 saw 17 new homes on Travis Trail, Shelley and Lane, and Coleman Crescent. Recently, Wiley Creek Estates added another 25 homes. Silver Creek Estates is now under construction and will add another 35 homes to Hallville. In May of 2021, the township announced that $2.7 million was going to be invested in the development of the Hallville Park. 722, $727,742 to be contributed by your township. Your worship, does this amount include the funds 
from the sale of the St. John's Park lot and other funds that were raised by our previous recreation committees. In the spring of 2021, it was also publicly announced that our residents would have input on one of two design plans. We were advised to stay tuned for the public meeting coming shortly to discuss the details of the project and the development options. We are still waiting for this meeting. This past month, an inquiry was made on the status of our promised park. We had understood that phase one would be starting. It, is, it was learned that, in fact, no plans were going forth for the year 2022. Again, we wait. It was this last information that led our delegation here this evening. There's several residents at the back of the room. Your Worship, we have collected signatures from local residents to submit to you tonight. We have collected 175 signatures from our residents. We also asked residents to record how many children they have in the household and or grandchildren that could potentially be using this park when it is completed. Of the 119 residents we attended, a total of 218 children in our community are waiting for a safe place to play. Uh, Your Worship, I have all the, there's 14 pages of signatures here. I'll leave that with you. Thank you. Okay. Our request. A committed Hallville Park development plan from the Township of North Dundas and communication through the promised public consultation. That's just all we're asking, just to communication is keep updated and know what the plan is. Concern number two, safety concerns for our residents, our children and grandchildren, walking along County Road number one within the village. Our residents voiced concerns over the stretch of road. It is the link between the different expanding residential areas in Hallville, the link to get to our local community general store and the link that physically brings us together as a community. This stretch of road is a concern due to speeding vehicles, increased traffic as a commuter route to Ottawa, its narrow shoulders adjacent to very deep ditches, lack of sidewalks and poor lighting. We do understand your worship that it is a county road and therefore a county's issue, but our request we just want to understand the working relationship between the township and the county roads department. How will council work with the counties to address our safety concerns and ensure this is dealt with while planning the Hallville Community Park development? Those are our concerns and requests. On behalf of the Hallville community, thank you, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor, Councillors, for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Oh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Cook, for uh, for being here tonight and presenting that. Uh, um, it's um, it's good information to have, and uh, uh, the uh, the small census, I guess, is going to be interesting too. Uh, yeah. It'll. I've often wondered, just thinking about how many how many homes have gone up recently, but there's the information there, and then the number of children, and and, and so on and so on and so forth. But as for uh, some of the questions you had. Um, on the sale of the park, yes, that's going towards mm -hmm. the uh, the 720, the number you have, right. you mentioned. That's part of that. And uh, I guess for future reference, or in the, in the spirit of communication, the uh, the uh, the rink, which is in disrepair, and the pr proposal will probably include that a rink elsewhere at the new park, um, that too would go, the sale of that would go towards okay. offsetting those costs at the 727. Mm -hmm. So that those funds would be used <clears throat> to, I think, to answer those questions. Um, I'm just trying to, I didn't get my notes written down quickly enough. Uh, but as for the uh, the safety, we've been in conversation, and uh, I know uh, the Deputy Mayor and I were walking that last summer, two summers ago, uh, the culvert outside of, uh, to be familiar, Brian and Lynn Telford's, mm -hmm. and that's the one I think we're referring to mm -hmm. in that area. Uh, it was in disrepair. We brought it up at County Council about the need of with the, the oncoming development of the park. That was the, the hopes and dreams at the time. Uh, there was discussion about what are we going to do? The culvert's too small to allow anything to happen, but I think we argued the point that the culvert was in disrepair, and uh, there's going to be a change to that, which would would uh, alter the landscape of that road, offer uh, safer access for pedestrians. 
Ms. Mirberg has, in her grant application, included safety, mm -hmm. pedestrian safety. That's all part of that program. Okay. That, uh, I'm not sure if that was... Uh, it's all under the widely, funding, then, that's been Widely granted? read, but okay. that, that information is there. Uh, that's all part of the okay. project to ensure there's safety to get to the, uh, to the park. Um, help me out here. What were some of the other questions? Do you have it listed there, Deputy Mayor? Uh, she, yeah, they're asking for better public, communication. Public, yeah. Uh, some yeah. of the dates are a little off, but uh, you know, just you covered St. John's property. There's things about 1990, early 1990s, I think, or something was said. That would have been the township of. Uh, that yeah, would have been the township. But the, of the amalgamation. That was when the the new park area was purchased. I, mean, I think the park the park property. Uh, just for clarity, I'm not sure of which one you're speaking about, but the first amalgamated council purchased nine acres, I want to say, but that was that was not purchased by, by residents or that was purchased by the township. Correct. Um, there were there were reasons why that property was sold that that uh, we would not talk about at this point in time, but uh, that was a, that was certainly a council decision. The timeline, and, and I don't want to. Uh, I, I don't want to disrespect anybody by falling on what is a familiar refrain, but some of the timeline for some of the things that Ms. Mirberg and Council would have said for when we would be expecting some of these things to come along and have some progress on the park, as corny as it's going to sound, Ms. Cook, it, uh, they were affected by COVID in the last two years. Mm -hmm. It did delay things. Mm -hmm. It is unfortunate because it has been a long, it's been a long wait for Council too. It's not like we don't want to build this thing, but it did throw a real spanner into the works, and I think you would have seen something by now had it, had we not spent on what we've done in almost three years now, you know, through COVID and everything. Um, I know it's easy to say, but it just that's just yeah. a fact, and that <coughs> it more affected the landscape of of what the counties was going to do in regards to your safety and, and the changing of the culverts and roads than it did uh, our funding or not. So mm -hmm. that's um, a couple things. Thank you for uh, reminding me of the communication aspect. Uh, there, there's, uh, you're right. It's, we're, we're going along and we get caught up in our own mm -hmm. worlds and uh, we, uh, we question what's going on with the park because it is, it's going to be the, the biggest amount, the largest amount of money spent in a park in North Dundas. It's, it, it's, it's of course top of mind. It's something that we're proud of the efforts of Ms. Mirberg to secure this funding. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, the, whenever we discuss it, the thoughts and dreams of what it's going to look like who it's going to serve, the number of homes, uh, mm -hmm. that community, uh, the people that will be coming from with the outside of the community mm -hmm. to inside the community. It's it, it's something that we all look forward to, and uh, we discuss it. And as the deputy mayor says, it is a well-used excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have juggling ar arena schedules to ensure that we can have COVID vaccinations conducted and you know, work, it, it, things ball up. But uh, there has been a failure on our end, and uh, I'll take ownership on that, on the communication aspect. I should have been driving it harder. Uh, I did have a, a, a person that I was going to be working with on the communication and uh, as my, uh, my lightning rod in, uh, in Hallville, and uh, she's no longer in Hallville. It's not her fault. It's my fault. I didn't seek out someone else to be my go-to person to have that conversation with. Um, but things internally are progressing, and uh, but there will be. Uh, I, I, sh I make a, I'll make a commitment that we'll be better at uh, promoting and mm -hmm. announcing steps and projects like this sure. one and other projects. Um, you you uh, clearly brought it to our attention. Good. That we are, there's a failure. And that and that was the whole point, just to come here and and just make you aware that we are, we have been waiting, and I just need we needed it on record that we're. And that's, and that's appreciated and understood. I know okay. we had a conversation earlier, and, a, yeah. and I was quite open to this idea of coming yeah. here because I, I understand. Okay. I understand that need, and it's, it's, it's truly a need. Um, now, on our, this is the 21st, so our last meeting was the 14th, I believe. Thank you. And uh, we discussed um, moving ahead with the landscape architect. I think that was part of the mm -hmm. discussion we had. And, uh, and there was back and forth with the grant uh, the, the people that are going to deliver the grant, how does that work? So there's time, but not much time, but time lost in that. 
So at that fort uh, the meeting on the 14th, there was a discussion and a commitment that um, the July 12th meeting, we'll see, thank you, we'll see something at the table for council, not strictly for council, but it'll be presented to council as some of the design work that's been done to okay. get to this point. So the ball is rolling. Good. And it's moving ahead. Um, there were plans in the uh, capital uh, justification report I had seen, and there were steps that were expected to take place in 2022. But as anyone who's tried to build anything in 2021 mm -hmm. or 2022, uh, things are delayed, people aren't mm -hmm. available. So that timeline is, is going to be skewed, con not considerably, but there's a skewing to that timeline. And uh, But nevertheless, we'll have information here at the at our next council meeting in July, okay. and uh, we'll have an opportunity to see that. Now, some of the things that um, also changed the the the, uh, the progress of uh, making announcements is um, consideration of different aspects of the park that weren't included in the grant proposal. Okay. So we're looking at <clears throat> can we. Can we alter the proposal when that was a discussion that needed to be had and it goes up the line to the province and the province says we'll talk to the feds and then there's other, other groups that have to be consulted if we're allowed to alter the, uh, the application or do we seek that on a separate grant application? And um, so we're waiting for information on that but uh, whenever we have the proposals ready, um, there will be aspects in the presentation that aren't part of the grant. So it sort of hinges on information coming from the province and the feds. If we can alter that to the satisfaction of the community, or do we hold off and seek further grants, future grants, to incorporate these other aspects into the park? It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, no. the park won't be completed overnight. No, it's I realize be, that. You know, it's yeah. a large project. Mm -hmm. There's earth moving and grading and all, all kinds of things take place so it it's it's going to be a large park it's going to take time for it to uh, become complete mm -hmm. uh, but uh, please uh, and like I say my apologies for the, uh, the communication but uh, trust me it is a topic that we discuss very often in-house good okay thank you very much well thank you for your presentation okay Uh, seeing as it's, um, we have a Nick, a Nick here, but uh, uh, Ms. Blanchard, I hope you can bear with me. I'm going to segue a little bit from the, uh, the delegation and um, the agenda. Uh, we have a presentation tonight, and I see uh, Mr. Foley's here, and I'd like to uh, celebrate Mr. Foley, and then we'll move to uh, Ms. Blanchard. Well, Terry, I'm sure you'll be able to find a seat. Listen. Way to clear the house there. <laughs> well, I thought there, I thought, I, I actually thought a lot of those people were here for Terry. Yeah. Well, Terry, Mr. Foley, um, the province of Ontario sent out a message to municipalities essentially polling us on finding someone or, or, or recognize someone that's made outstanding contributions to the community. And I hate to say it, who is also a senior. Um, so when Angela received the information, Angela approached me and uh, not only because uh, I know you and I like you, but I know what you do for our community and I think uh, I immediately thought of um, you and your actions organizing, participating, and ensuring that the COVID vaccination clinics in North Dundas, especially in Winchester, were uh, well attended, well organized, and it represented us in North Dundas very well. And that was one of the things that I thought about. 
I also think uh, it quickly came to mind <clears throat> my efforts or my, my ability to participate alongside you and Marianne and your fellow uh, Mountain and District Lions at the uh, Christmas Hamper Project. Your unflinching willingness to ensure that it runs smoothly, your willingness to reach out to others to ensure that they participate and have an opportunity to uh, support what Mountain and District Lions do and the Lions Clubs, the other two Lions Clubs in North Dundas as well, with uh, supporting the Christmas Hamper Program. The list can go on, I will. I think of your, uh, you know, I don't think, I know of your time with the North Dundas Fire Prevention Committee, the North Dundas Fire Department, uh, previous to that with the Mountain Fire Department. Um, the list goes on and on. So I'm, I'm looking forward Yes. I'm looking forward to the mayor, or the deputy mayor, saying a few words as well before I make the presentation. No, you weren't out very long. Terry, Terry, Terry. Seems like only 20 years ago I was standing up here giving you your 50th year award for the fire department. Don't take it as a, as a slight that we're giving you too many awards, but there was 55 people who just left, Terry. So maybe we'll cap it at this one, okay? <laughs> It'll be enough. They're getting a little tired of it. But you deserve it. There's no question you deserve it. Um, again, it, I mean, it's been 18 years that I've been the fire commissioner, and you're almost three times on the fire services like that. I mean, and, and I, that that's not a joke. That's... Just all, I see everybody I see out here, I've, I've seen you all contributing to this community. But just think of, you know, 50 years in the fire department, and that's a few years ago as well. That is unwavering commitment to the number one volunteer situation that we have in North Dundas. I say it, and I say it every year at the awards, and I say it again, and I'll say it right now. It's the only volunteer position in which you are not guaranteed that you will come home on that particular evening. And this man spent 50 years it's just selflessly giving to the community. You can't, you can't have any, you can't have a higher level of commitment to your community, in my opinion, than being a volunteer firefighter and holding a position of rank for 30, am I, it was 35 odd years you were captain of Bob Terry, if you can just correct me. So much, I mean, it's just phenomenal. I just, I say it every time and I just can't believe it. Um, Terry is, is quintessential to, to almost any, any person at any age that uh, uh, by this time that has walked anywhere throughout North Dundas and, and enjoyed uh, the facilities that we have, opportunities that we have. It's likely that Terry Foley or some organization that he was involved with had a hand in that. And just think of that, 12,000 people, the thousands of square kilometers that we have, and Terry has committed his time and his family's time, and with Marianne right there with him, going and giving up to, to the community. I mean, it's just, you know, we don't make them like that anymore. I mean, and he's been doing it. I, I don't want to say Terry's old, but he's been doing it. Like, Ray Shearer sent me a picture today, and I swear to God, it's like a 10-year-old Don Levere holding a 25-year-old Terry Foley's hand trying to cross the road. So he's been around for a while. It's, um, it's... I mean, your work collecting dinosaur eggs throughout the community and getting them off the roads was just phenomenal, Terry. You, you know, you, you, you've been committed for as long as a person can be committed. Um, I'm glad you were able to win this award in your 60th and final year of eligibility, and, and it's a great night to give it to you. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, I'm just fumfering, Terry, but it's the same thing I said to you on the fire night. In all possible respect and deference to you. No community has been better served than North Dundas has been served by having the Foley family involved in it. And, and for that, we truly thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. And I, and I appreciate following Al because I don't have to try to be witty, it's done. But Terry, I, I, do, I, do, I do think, and, I, and Angela's asked me if I've been giving it thought and I think about it and I think about it. Your, your service with the Mountain Lions, 
Mountain District Lions. A charter member, a long, long standing service to the community, as uh, the Deputy Mayor says. But more to that is the example you've set for many years on how to be a volunteer. And then I reflect to the, the, the vaccination clinics. You, your feet on the ground, your, your demonstration of, of, of organization and of volunteerism to a younger crowd, to young firefighters, which is key. Uh, we, and as, uh, as the Deputy Mayor says, we don't, we don't build them like that anymore, but it's your efforts that will create that. Your demonstration of volunteerism in our community to younger people is very, very important. And saying that, if you'd come up, please, we need to take some pictures. So, the Senior of the Year Award 2022 is presented to Terry Foley by the Municipality of the Township of North Dundas in recognition of your outstanding contributions to your community after age 65. Signed by the Honorable Raymond Chow and Elizabeth Doudsko, the, the Lieutenant Governor, and myself, Tony Fraser, the Mayor. Mr. Foley, thank you very much. I thank everybody for this. Uh, I think there's a lot of other people in the community that could deserve it just as much. Thank you very much. It's going to be a tough act to follow, Nick. So, our last delegation of the night is Ms. Blanchard. Please come ahead. <laughs> Me as well. It was on. It's still on. Oh, it's still on? Okay. Yeah, so it's not as exciting, but I guess I have a pattern of following uh, other stuff. <laughs> Um, so you have a final report to council. Uh, we finalized the audit. You have the draft financial statements. Um, I won't go into a lot of details because you've had a chance to read it. Uh, there's time at the end if there's questions. And for some of you, it looks the same from year to the year anyways. <laughs> so based on page two of this report, we have our summary 
at this point, the audit is completed. What we're missing is uh, finalizing subsequent events and obtaining representations once uh, Council approves the financial statements. Again, this year, receive full cooperation from uh, management, so we're able to uh, provide statements at this time. You did receive our planning report to Council dated February 22nd. There hasn't been any changes in our planned, uh, or what we did is still according to plan. Um, on pages four and five, you have very significant risks and areas of focus. So basically, our audit is risk-based. Uh, you have the audit findings, or so they're all that um, there's nothing to raise to this uh, to council, or it's covered in other places in our report. Um, page six, we reconfirm it's not internal controls audit, but we look at internal controls. So it's hence the management letter uh, that we have in Appendix B. When we look at Appendix C, so it, uh, Appendix A covers our, the adjustments that were proposed to management in Fosted. Um, the second page is the unadjusted differences, um, basically well below, below materiality, so uh, nothing that we propose adjusting. Um, and in our management letter to, um, to <laughs> management, so some suggestions that could be, uh, I guess, things that could be improved. Uh, we mentioned the changes that are coming to the public sector accounting standards. No changes in 2022, but significant ones for in 2023 uh, that will require um, preparation. So asset retirement obligation being the largest one. So fortunately, there's preparation, so costs involved. So we want to make sure that uh, council is also aware. And then the other points are um, items from the information uh, systems auditors. Um, I'm mentioning the accounting standards are not changing this year. Next year, the, uh, in 2022, the auditing standards are changing, so we have to be more risk, um, identifying more risks. So our information systems auditors are already implementing that. So that's why we have more suggestions and things that can be, that are highlighted, but it's not that things have changed uh, compared to the past. So before we go to the statements, are there questions in our, the actual audit work? Um, again, for financial statements, I don't propose to go into a lot of details unless there's questions. Um, and as you see from the adjustments that were posted, we only propose one entry. So basically what you have here is what management provided us. So it follows what you've seen in the past. Uh, so we do have management's responsibility. So again, reinforcing that they're not ours as auditors, but management's statements. Pages three and four, you have the independent auditor's report, so it's a clean opinion uh, that in all material respects, the financial statements present the uh, financial position of uh, the township at December 31st, 2021, and that's a, in accordance with Canadian accounting or public sector accounting standards. Uh, page four, so it will be dated tonight, assuming they're approved by council. On page five, you have the statement of financial position, so balance sheet or showing assets, liabilities, and net financial assets uh, and surplus for the township at December 31st. Um, so a couple of lines I wanted to mention. So at the top, you have the financial assets, so assets get, that can be transferred easily to cash at 20.6 million. Then you have liabilities at 11.1 million for net financial assets at uh, 9.5. So it's uh, something that is shown in public sector uh, statements. Um, so some organizations have the net financial assets, like in your case. Often we see a net debt um, position. So in your case, it's a positive cash flows. Um, and then the non-financial assets, so like tangible capital assets, and then the accumulated surplus at the bottom at 68.4 million, which has to be seen with note 10 because it's not all funds that are available to spend. Page six, statement of operations, so revenues, expenses, um, and annual surplus for the year, so revenues at 14.4 million, expenses at 12.6 for an annual surplus of 1.9, pretty much in line with budgets, uh, which were 15.3, 13.7, and planned surplus at 2.1. Pages seven and eight are basically reconciling the net financial assets and the cash at the end of the year, so I don't propose going in details. Um, when we get to the notes, so the first one in accounting policies, I was saying there will be a lot of changes in 2023, but 2021, it was this, there were no changes, so that note is the same as what you would have seen in the past. 
Um, then the other notes are providing more information on balances that you have on a statement of financial position or a statement of operations. So I don't propose going in detail except for page 18 where we have the accumulated surplus note. Um, so I was saying the 68.4 has to be taken in that split. So uh, if somebody wants to look at what's part of the surplus, you have this, it's the reserves, the reserve funds, uh, and what's invested in tangible capital assets. Um, so that's on uh, a couple of pages, but that would be the only note that I think would be uh, important to look at if you only look at one. So again, I'm not sure if there's questions on the statements themselves. Do we have questions on the statements themselves? <laughs> Seeing none. Um, but I do have a question, Nick, about you say the changes that are coming. Who, what drives those changes for 2023? Uh, public sector, um, I guess, public sector accounting board. Um, they were supposed to be for 2022, but with the different delays and COVID, they were pushed to that year. Um, so what will be required is, I guess the reason, I'll go back. The reason for the changes is the accounting standard setters want to bring financial statements for public sector organizations similar to townships, hospitals, and so forth, more similar to not-for-profit organizations, which already have an asset retirement obligation standard. So what that means is any asset that you have, you have to calculate how much it would take to remediate any, like the common one would be asbestos, or um, so in an if you like a hospital, radiation, radiology and the radiation impacts. So in those organizations, it already has to be calculated, which is not too, compli too complicated because there's not a lot of old buildings. When you look at municipalities, hospitals, there's a lot of older buildings. We need to quantify those impacts. Um, so if we were to sell or demolish the buildings, what would it cost us? And that needs to be done for all assets of uh, the township. So, uh, so I guess for me, the answer would be that these practices are already in place in other, for other organizations, other groups, and it just becomes a best practice. Uh, it's across, yes, it's across Canada. It will be required best practice, more than best practice, because it's a requirement of the accounting standards, unfortunately. It's okay for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, so it will show a liability in the statements. Ms. Rutley. In most cases, yes, because most organizations, most municipalities don't have the expertise in house. You can identify which, where there are costs, but determining those costs, most places are having the consultants for that. And I guess to piggyback on that, uh, are there enough consultants that are, <laughs> are, are, are um, competent enough to deliver that for, for everyone in 2023? That's, <laughs> that's a good question. I, we can inquire with our uh, national team if they know of different firms or how it's done. I mean, how, what's the impacts? But I, no, it just seems to me that if it's going to become something that municipalities are going to undertake, that there would be, well, in Ontario, 442 municipalities will be hiring people to ensure that this is done properly. That's quite a few. And this is the same for people. hospitals and school boards. They're in the same boat. So, yes, that's a lot. I'm in the wrong field. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, any, anything from other members of council? Seeing, yes, Mr. Garreau. I'm just, I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. like, what buildings do we own specifically on the reserves? Like, if you mentioned hospitals, do we own a hospital? No, no, no. I mean, like, hospitals are outside. Yeah, any, any building. Arenas, our arena, for example? This so building, any building. And the landfills will now go into that standard, but as opposed to the liability for uh, one. Great number. <laughs> 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 I, 
I dare not ask. I dare not say what I think. <laughs> I'm not making the rules. It's, it's going to be quite a change. Yes, because it's adding a lot of liabilities, and then the flip side is not an expense. It's increasing the value of the assets. So the statements will look completely different in addition to the extra work. But the good thing with municipalities, it will be December as opposed to hospitals will be affected next March and then school boards next August. You still, you'll have seen or will have seen examples of how it is in real life. How expensive it is. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. Blanchard, uh, I'm, unless there's something from staff. Okay. Thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. Appreciate it. We're gonna move into action request, Mr. Garot, please. Moved by Councillor Annable, second by Councillor Thompson, the council adopts the attached 2022 excluded expenses report dated June 1st, 2022, regarding additional financial disclosure requirements for the 2022 budget year pursuant to Ontario Regulation 284-09, Mr. Garot. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, yes, not quite enough changes, so we're here to ask you to please uh, accept our excluded expenses report. Um, in a nutshell, what this what this is really getting at, if you look at the background part, uh, OREG 28409 permits the municipality to exclude from their annual budget three specific expenses. Um, this is on page 81 or 85, depending which way you're looking. Um, 81. Sorry, uh, the three expenses are amortization expense, post-employment benefits, and solid waste closure uh, and post-closure. So we don't have any post-employment expenses. We only have one and three. And this uh, permits us, as I say, to prepare our budget on a cash basis, which is what we do. And it is what all other municipalities in SD&G do as well, and it's what all municipalities, as far as I know, in Ontario do uh, as well. But the intent underneath that of OREG 28409 is to move municipalities, much as Ms. Blanchard was saying, is to move us away from this cash-based form of financial reporting that municipalities like to live in and to move us into mainstream accounting. And so they want to encourage municipalities to plan for and to budget for those three types of expenses that were listed above. We don't currently budget for depreciation or amortization or solid waste landfill. So if these expenses are excluded and they are, we have to prepare a report on the impact and adopt the report by resolution, hence why we're here tonight. So since 2009, PSAB, um, again, Mrs. Blanchard referred to that, uh, the Public Sector Accounting Board, they require us to record the cost of tangible capital assets and amortization, and we do that in our annual financial statements, although we don't run them through uh, our books. And those are mentioned on the bottom of page 81, that amortization expense, the budget excludes that because it's a non-cash expense. And at the end of the day, I'm sure council knows, our budgets are prepared on a, we call it a cash basis, but it's not really a cash basis, what we call modified cash basis. We recognize payables, we recognize receivables, we recognize prepaids, we just don't recognize depreciation and, and some of the other ones. And the reason, of course, that we do that is because when we pass our budget, we want to make sure we can raise enough cash from taxation revenue to fund our expenditures and whether those expenditures are operational in nature or whether they're capital in nature, we want to have the cash to fund them. And so our budgets are not quite maybe the same as you would see in, in the private sector. Page 82 talks about post-employment benefits, which we don't have, solid waste uh, landfill closure, which we do have. The auditors put through an entry at the end of the year. It's in the financial statements that Ms. Blanchard just presented for $384,000. And that's a lot of money, yes. Um, if you're wondering why I don't get too excited about it, it's because it's a, what, what we call in accounting parlance, it's a balance sheet entry. Yes, she's they recorded a liability for $384,000, but the other side of it went to an asset account on the balance sheet. So the impact on surplus was zero. So um, it, we, we don't budget for it for that, for that very reason. 
And again, this is coming about because of PSAB. So the options are to approve the recommendation, which is obviously what we recommend. Approval of this report in compliance with legislation would result in these transactions being included in, in Township North Dundas's 2022 audited financial statements. If we don't approve it, um, it would result in us not being in compliance with OREG 28409. Without this excluded expense report, the 2022 approved budget would require an amendment to include these costs. So let's step around it. They're allowing us to step around it, so we will do that. Financial analysis, there's no direct financial impact on the township. This is simply providing information on non-cash related transactions. <coughs> Our budget is prepared, as I mentioned before, modified cash basis and non-cash transactions are excluded. Those that we think should be included are, are already in there. There are some attachments uh, on page 83. There is the reconciliation that 28409 asks us to show council what the impact is of excluding these expenses. So um, we had amortization in our 2021 financial statements of 2.7 million, so it wasn't in our budget. Here's the impact, there. had we recorded, would have had that impact on our surplus. The land foreclosure, post-closure, we don't record it, would have had that impact on our surplus. We've broken that depreciation down by uh, asset class in one table and by department in another table, just to show council the impact that would have popped up um, for the various departments. The only other thing that I would like to cover on page 84 is the OREG itself, which I've, I've already spoken to, and I'd like to cover page 85, if I may. This is a reconciliation of our surplus to the auditor's surplus, because you heard me go on at length here about we don't record depreciation. They do, uh, they being the auditors, they don't re recognize transfers in and out of reserves either. We, we do. Transfers to reserves is an expense to us. To them, it's nothing. They call it below the line. Transfers out of, revenue, out of reserves is revenue to us. They don't recognize that. It's below the line. So we have a radically different surplus number on our modified cash basis than what the auditors have. And you heard Mrs. Blanchard say that the surplus was 1.9 million, and that's the last number on this page right here. Um, in my next report, I'm going to tell you that the surplus for 2021 was $472,300.27. It's quite a difference from 1.9. So what, what happened? Well, what happened was, <clears throat> We show tangible capital assets as an expense in our budget, as I mentioned earlier, and then we show the long-term borrowing to finance them as a revenue. The auditors don't, don't show it that way. So we have to add back those tangible capital assets because it's an asset, not an expense. We have to deduct depreciation because we don't show it of 2.7 million. There was disposition of assets of over half a million. Transfers in and out of reserves, they don't count that at all, and it was 2.2 million in and 1.9 million out, so a net swing of 220. The PSAB uh, landfill adjustment, we don't recognize. Principal payments on long-term debt, we recognize that as an expense, 133,000. They don't. And the last one is $2 million loan that we borrowed from Infrastructure Ontario. We recognize as financing or as revenue, and they don't count that. So when you put in all these pluses and minuses, how do they do it, how do we do it, we reconciled to within 30 cents, and it's only out 30 cents because they use dollars and we use pennies. <laughs> I thought of rounding it, but my OCD wouldn't let me. <laughs> and that concludes our report. Thank you, Mr. Grohl. Questions, comments? Councillor Bergeron. Okay, so Mr. Gatto, what you're saying is the actual surplus that we have is the 472,000. That's what I'm saying, okay. yes. Right. Yes, that is, and I, and I say it that way uh, in all seriousness because that's how we budget it, right? I have to bring you the financial statements in the same way that we budget it, otherwise they're meaningless. If we budget on a cash basis and I bring you the statements on the full accrual basis what the auditors are using, the numbers are all over the place, nothing means anything. So this way, we, we, we budget on a modified cash. Here's the statements on a modified cash. Comparing apples to apples, we have a $472,000 surplus. If there's no further questions, we all, uh, no further questions or comments from Mr. Garreau, we all heard the question. All those in favor, opposed, seeing none, that's carried. <clears throat> Thank you very much.
Move by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Annabelle, that Council endorses and approves the asset management plan in accordance with Ontario Regulation 588-17. Mr. Garreau. Uh, yes, on pages 86 and 87 of my report, uh, we were asking Council that, that very question. A uh, little bit of background again. Uh, according to OREG 588-17, we have to have an asset management plan in place for all core assets. Core assets are defined as roads, bridges, storm, water, sewer infrastructure, the deadline was originally July 1st, 2021, so a year ago, but if you recall, we came to council and um, all the treasurers had kind of said to uh, the province that we can't possibly make that deadline, so they extended it from July 1, 2021 to July 1, 2022, which is in just a few days away. And for all non-core assets, that deadline was July 1, 2023. It's been extended by a year out as well. So the regulation told us that's what we had to do, but it provided very little direction on how to actually accomplish that goal. So there's a lot of confusion around the formulation of this asset management plan. And this issue appears to have been systemic throughout municipalities in Ontario because the Federation of Canadian Municipalities under the auspices of the Municipal uh, Asset Management Program partnered with AMO um, and offered free asset management technical assistance to Ontario municipalities, of which council members um, even uh, got training and just to make you aware that, hey, this is going on and uh, make sure your staff are trained, et cetera. So with the onset of COVID and the lack of available trained staff, the technical nature of the requirements or other issues as well, time constraints weren't realistic. They're extended to July 1st, 2021 for core assets and July 1st, 2024 for all others and other deadlines are similarly extended by one year. We were fortunate uh, at the time to have the services of Michelle Dory. She was a summer student here back in May of 2019. She expressed an interest in working in this area. She took the lead in maintaining our capital asset records. She did an excellent job completing the required process of capital asset reporting for our year-end audited financial statements. And this uh, all led to her developing an interest in participating in this, in this program. So over the course of the last three years, she's been working in concert with initially Dan Harper of Small Town Software in an effort to meet our reporting requirements. And uh, they scrubbed our data in preparation for updating the asset management plan. She undertook a great deal of formal training on how to create and, and implement um, such a plan. And um, much of that training was online and some even on her own time because she was back in school from September to December of 2019. Um, in the fall of 2021, we, um, we hired Ms. Dory on full time. And um, also in the summer fall of 2021, Mr. Harper announced he's winding up his company and advised us we'd have to find an alternate provider of this specialized software. So in November of 2021, a motion came to council asking to award the contract for provision of software to public sector digest PSD, which is what most other municipalities in sd and we're using, still are using, and now we're using them as well. And Michelle has been very busy uh, migrating all of our data from the software program that we had with Dan Harper over to this new program with Public Sector Digest. So all of this is to say we have Ms. Dory with us here tonight, and she's about to present the asset management plan and the culmination of three years of hard work and dedicated service and at the end of it all uh, we're asking council to approve this plan and these plans are supposed to be approved by council by july 1 2021 so under options and discussion uh, obviously we're asking for approval thank you i think we'll just move right over to ms doray and uh and have her speak for a while fine do you want me to return to my chair or stand next to her <laughs> 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 Good evening, members. Good evening. As your asset management coordinator, it's my pleasure to present to you the first of three renditions of North Dundas's asset management plan as per Ontario Regulation 588-17, asset management for municipal infrastructure. As per the legislation, just to rehash a bit of what John said, uh, the purpose of the document is to compile, verify, standardize, and analyze data related to the condition assessments, levels of service, life cycles, and risk, as risk analysis for township assets. For the July 1st deadline of this year, core assets were uh, the center point to address their status as the backbone of municipal services. In 2024, non-core assets are, are intended to be included, and 2025 brings us the financial strategy component and setting official targets. 
The end goal of this process is to develop methods to get the longest life out of our assets at the least cost. It should be noted that asset management plan is considered a living document, and so it will be updated as better information is acquired, whether by internal or external activities. Core assets are, of course, our biggest customers for expense needs, and they are roads, bridges, storm, water, and wastewater. It's through these that North Dundas provides its services to its residents and commercial businesses, and so it's integral to find better ways to track, analyze, and predict what's coming down the line. Throughout the document, it is designed to show not only the main asset, for example, the three road surfaces, but also includes the supporting assets to deliver a network overview. While roads can exist on their own, the surface uh, they provide would be radically different if not for their, their minor infrastructure they're connected to. For this reason, we aim for a deeper understanding of the service by tracking the condition and cost of everything under each respective umbrella for every type of network. Non-core assets have been included at an over overview, which includes assets from community halls to laptops, from playground equipment to fire trucks. These assets are not mandatory in the AMP until 2024, so they've not been thoroughly broken down in, uh, into uh, individual subclasses. Due to the broad nature of these categories, information is potentially distorted when comparing condition. For example, one playground um, uh, structure given the same weight as one length of fencing, but still given an, gives an excellent estimate for replacement costs and age assessments. This plan does not include the building condition assessment study, which is due to be completed this summer. As an overview, North Dundas's assets have a total replacement cost of 319.4 million. Once current estimated life cycle events are calculated in, this becomes 386.6 million or $839.73 per capita with an annual requirement of 9.5 million. North Dundas has been gradually increasing our capital investments over the years. So the actual spending right now is about 6.1 uh, million. This calculates to a 3.4 million funding shortfall. The graph you see here, you probably recognize from page 19, is the difference between the actual rate of reinvestment in green against the estimated, estimated rate uh, that's a target in yellow, grouped by category. While pavement condition indexes and bridge condition indexes may disagree on numerical values for what is considered good, by converting them into a standardized rating from excellent to very poor, assets can be more readily compared. With 56% of all assets relying on age-based assessments at the moment, 70% of all township assets are rated as fair and above. However, when we judge assets from an age perspective, we do see that 16.8% of assets are showing as in use beyond their useful lives. This backlog may be distorted, at least in part due to the nature of age-based assets. Um, however, it will be important to perform studies to weed these out um, because they may be skewing the numbers. The usual suspects are assets that are replaced in parts. So in this way, it'd be gravel roads, ma uh, maintenance accesses, hydrants, and buildings. Individually, the demands of infrastructure for a service can be manageable, but asset management is intended to focus specifically on finding a way to manage the problem of overlapping demands. When we compare asset networks, there's plenty of need for the finite funds that we have. We know that the capacity in our water, uh, water and wastewater networks are being maxed out. For roads, our LCB surfaces are not holding up with, with increased traffic, so conversions to HCB are in progress. However, gravel roads are also showing extra wear um, with an average gravel condition index that barely puts it in fair over poor. It is possible that our roads are being adversely affected by our uh, bridge and culvert network because 37% of our structures have dimensional restrictions, as you can see by there with the road width. Um, our building condition assessment is due to wrap up this summer but our storm water network is, uh, needs assessment next and might uh, it might need re rehabilitation. It, I'm sorry, I just lost my spot here. To protect the residents from worsening storms due to climate change. On top of that, uh, condition assessments are going to be needed for all of our assets, both core and non-core alike. 
With all these demands and current estimates, it's unsurprising that we're facing a uh, reinvestment short shortfall, especially because, as we know, North Dundas is growing. Our population projections are only increasing due to pressure from Ottawa and the current social trends, trends towards a rural living, and not to even mention the, that we're within commute distance to the city. So it's safe to say that any capacity issues we're dealing with are only going to be burned more as the years go on. So this is where we stand with our asset management plan. Although it may seem overwhelming, we are certainly not alone. All municipalities are facing the same deteriorating networks, the same capacity issues, the same need for data, and the same funding shortfalls. As we continue to gather data and invest where we can, these assessments will only become clearer and a financial strategy can be put in place in 2025 to create a more sustain sustainable North Dundas. Thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, questions, I think, Councillor Bergeron. I just have a comment. That's an amazing report. I mean, there was a lot of work in that. I read that and I go, wow, a lot of time and effort. So congratulations on such a good job. Thank you so much. I, I share Councillor Bergeron's thoughts. Uh, Michelle, I, I see you quite often at the office and uh, I'm, I, I think it's good that I don't bother you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I didn't bother others, there'd be uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, your efforts and uh, are truly appreciated. It's, and whenever you say other municipalities are in the same boat, I, I don't think they truly are in the same boat as we are with Mr. Garo and yourself uh, at the helm, if you would. Uh, I think we're in a, in a good state. We're moving ahead well. And uh, again, uh, kudos to your efforts, uh, to the presentation and, and to delivering that this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We've all heard the question. Are all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. Public Works, Mr. Tunio. Moved by Councillor Annable, seconded by Councillor Thompson, the Council authorized staff to seek permission from the United Counties of SD&G to close a portion of County Road 3, Winchester Main Street, from Louise Street to Albert Street, Mill Street, as well as a portion of County Road 38, St. Lawrence Street, from Winchester Main Street to Caleb Street, to vehicular traffic between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturday, November 12, 2022, to facilitate a Christmas market in Winchester. Mr. Tunio. Uh, good evening, Mayor Fraser, Deputy Mayor Armstrong, members of the council. Uh, so winter is coming, so this uh, uh, report seek council approval to do a road closure on County Road 3 from uh, Louisa Street to Alberta Street and on County Road 38 from Main Street to Caleb Street to allow for a m Christmas market um, by Kelly Wendell of, of the planted arrow flowers and gifted and gifts. So the request uh, once approved by the council will, will be sent to STG uh, for their consideration. Thank you. Questions, comments from Mr. Tunio? Seeing none, we all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Annabelle, the Council authorized staff to seek permission from the United Counties of SDG to close Winchester Main Street, County Road 3, from Mill Street to Louise Street, and from the intersection of Main Street, County Road 3, and St. Lawrence Street, County Road 38, to Church Street, to vehicular traffic to facilitate the 2022 Winchester Dairy Fest celebrations on Saturday, August 6, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Sunday, August 7, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So... This report has a couple of options. The option that uh, identified in the resolution is a, a longer closure for the roadway uh, of County Road 3 from Mill Street to um, uh, to Louisa Street, uh, and on and uh, and uh, basically from Saint uh, and from Main Street from Saint Lawrence Street to Church Street. Um, to allow for a winter Winchester Dairy Fest celebration uh, for the August 6th and 7th. And the staff have reviewed it, and uh, we have no ish concerns or issues with either of the two options. 
those options, uh, the two options are shown with a highlighted sketch in the back with a grad as a minimum request to road close and the blue is, uh, is further extension. So if the uh, council is okay with the council resolution, then it's a, it's a maximum closure they request for. Thank you. Questions, comments? Councilor Bergeron. I just have a small question. If, if Center Road is closed for a while, is that a big issue for Winchester, like the Center, Center Street? Because it, it's anyone coming from the <coughs> north is blocked there. They can't. I just wondered if that's an issue. <coughs> no? You wouldn't come down Center Street? No, I won't come down Center Street? Okay. <laughs> and, and, and they could go back Otto Street to Queen Street and go west. And yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. We've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none? Carried. Move by Councilor Bergeron, second by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, that council, council authorized staff to seek permission from the United Counties of SDG to close the designated portion of County Road 13 in Morewood from the intersection of Moffat Street at the Cenotaph to the intersection of Russell Street to vehicular traffic on Wednesday, July 6, 2022, between the hours of 5.45 p.m. and 6.45 p.m. This will facilitate the 100-year com commemoration of the Morewood Cenotaph, which will be in addition to and will coincide with Meet Me on Main Street celebrations and its association, associated road closures approved by Council on April 19, 2022. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So earlier, Council approved uh, closure of Moffat Main Street uh, to for the Meet Me on the Main Street event. Um, so this request is to slightly extend the road closure uh, of uh, County Road 3 from Moffat Street to Russell Street uh, to 400 year commemoration of the Mo the Morewood Senator. Uh, and the staff have reviewed the request and have no concerns. Questions, comments from Mr. Tunio? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you, Mr. Tunio. Madam Clerk. Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, second by Councilor Bergeron, that the Council of the Township of North Dundas confirms they have no objection to the Winchester Legion extending their liquor license to include the Legion's parking lot from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. on Saturday, August 6, 2022, as part of the Dairy Fest event. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Council. Um, in order for this to happen, AGCO requires a letter from the clerk, but there's very specific wording that has to be included, and the phrase that this is approved by council has to be in the letter, thus the report and the recommendation to council. Thank you. Questions, comments for the clerk? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you. Mr. Pohl. Moved by Councilor Bergeron, seconded by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, that Council hereby accepts the zoning bylaw amendment application as completed from Christine Dorothy and directs the public meeting to be held on July 12, 2022. Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mayor Fraser. <clears throat> so the first uh, application we have before us this evening is a rezoning application uh, submitted by Christine Dorothy, and she's requesting the rezoning of her property. It's currently in a commercial zone. She'd like to be able to add a residential zone uh, it is a bed and breakfast at the moment and was a dwelling unit before <clears throat> being turned into a bed and breakfast. Uh, she liked that zoning on there to help with mortgage purposes and things like that. It does abut the uh, residential zone around it. Um, so this would be a dual zone is what's being proposed. Uh, we'd like to move that towards a public meeting and have a full planning report on that uh, at the next council meeting. Thank you. Questions, comments from Mr. Paul? Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to be clear, because we have had some properties like this with going either way with, with people wanting to go from commercial to residential and vice versa, uh, just to be clear, just to make sure that I, I haven't forgotten some things, Mr. Paul. This is um, this is not like some of the other things that, that this council and previous council have not allowed because this, this actually creates 
dual opportunities as opposed to just removing any. The, the commercial aspect is lessened, I guess, arguably, but it's not eradicated. So just am I correct in noting that? Because we have denied some to, to go from commercial to strictly R1 residential. So in case anybody's confused on that, or, or am I the one that's confused? No, you're absolutely correct. This would be a dual zone. The commercial will stay on the property. It will allow them to have businesses in the dwelling unit also. Uh, if they want to convert either way, they can have uh, real estate offices, things like that, in this building or have it as a residential use with the bed and breakfast also. Right, and just one supplemental. And also, just to be clear for myself, uh, when we talk about the amalgam of, of residential and commercial being this, this will, this will be a, a situation where when you talk about the possibilities of what commercial uses can be in there, they will all have separate entrances, separate exits. There will, there's no cross section of the residential going into the commercial. So, it, there, there would be two standalone or three standalone if there was two offices in there, for instance. Yeah, that would be depending on how they set it up under the building code, uh, as separate uses. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those questions. Any further? Yes, Councillor Annabel. Oh, I just wonder, does that apply to the? sizable garage in the backyard as well could somebody come in and make that all commercial that that, building? yeah it is currently commercial and that will be able to, be, to continue as a commercial property okay so if they use the front and the back or the front and back depending on how they set it up so that would be a split zone so they could do both on the property okay. if there's nothing further we've all heard the question all those in favor opposed seeing none carried Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor Bergeron, that Council hereby accepts the zoning bylaw amendment application as completed from Xander Plan Inc. and directs the public meeting to be held on July 12, 2022. Mr. Paul. So we have before us a zoning amendment application. There was also an official plan amendment application submitted to the counties. Uh, so a joint meeting will be held uh, as proposed to be held on July 12, 2022. Uh, the request is to allow for an automotive, commercial, and farm equipment repair garage. On the subject property, it's right off of County Road 1 at Pepperville Road. It's well set back from the road and an isolated property. Uh, they would like to allow these uses in the existing uh, buildings on the property. Uh, but they require rezoning and official plan amendment to do so. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. We'll move into tenders and quotations, and Mr. Paul. Moved by Councillor Bergeron, second by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, that Council approves the award of tender number 02-2022 to Cornwall Nissan for a new white Nissan Frontier S four-wheel drive king cab truck for the purchase price of $43,390 plus HST. Mr. Paul, describe the truck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we did go to tender. We had it out for two weeks. We sent it out to every single dealership we could find, basically in the uh, Yellow Pages, local dealers in Cornwall and Ottawa. We only received one tender. Uh, vehicles are hard to find right now. Uh, this tender did meet the specifications in the tender request. Uh, it is available. Uh, it's on this property. They have it. Uh, it's been put aside, so we can get it uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, it is slightly over our budget amount by a small amount, and we can we anticipate savings within our department uh, existing budget to be able to compensate for the difference. Questions, comments for Mr. Paul? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, second by Councillor Bergeron, that Council approves the award of tender number PBE-01-2022 to Cornwall Hyundai for a new white four-door all-wheel drive Tucson Essential for the purchase price of $35,915.25 plus HST. Mr. Paul. So once again, we did the same approach. We sent the tenders out to all local uh, dealerships as well as some in Ottawa. Uh, trying to seek out a vehicle. We only received two tenders uh, back on it. Uh, one bid was rescinded uh, due to lack of available stock. Uh, they could not guarantee delivery before the year end. Actually, they have a waiting list of seven pages worth of people standing waiting for vehicles 
uh, for SUVs. These are very popular and hard to find anything in stock. Um, but we have one uh, submit submission that believes they'll have it in by the year end, uh, which is what we've asked for in our tender. And the submission is within our budget amount. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Tunio. Moved by Councillor Bergeron, seconded by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, the Council approves the award of tender PW-2022-06 to Colvoy Enterprises 2012 Limited for the supply of one telescopic industrial long shoot snowblower in the amount of $38,436.00 plus HST. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So this report seeks council approval to award the tender of telescopic industrial long shoot snowblower in the amount of 38436 uh, to uh, Colvoy Enterprises Limited. We received two bids, and uh, the lowest bid did not conform to the requirements. Uh, it was mostly in a farm type of equipment. Uh, this this bid uh, that has been approved is within the uh, uh, approved 2022 budget for this item. So there are no financial impacts. Thank you, Mr. Tunio. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, second by Councilor Bergeron, that Council approves the award of tender PW 2022-07 to Rush Truck Centers of Canada for the supply of one three-ton truck, four-by-four, four-door crew cab and chassis with dump box in the amount of $124,760 plus HST. Mr. Tunio. Uh, so thank you. So this report uh, is to seek Council approval for this three-ton truck uh, the, uh, to award the contract to Rush Truck Centers in the amount of 124760 plus HST. The award is within the approved budget. Uh, the only issue is the delivery timeline. Uh, we will be receiving some time in early 2023. Uh, the second bid uh, that uh, that was submitted uh, did not um, has um, has some uh, did not meet did not meet all the specifications. Um, so this also did not meet the specifications of the delivery schedule, but again, this is also the lowest as well. So we are still proceeding uh, and making a recommendation to proceed uh, with this truck uh, to and award the contract to Rush Truck uh, Centers of Canada. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none? Carried. Move by Councillor Bergeron, second by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, the Council approves the award of tender PW 2022-04 to the Calle Road Bridge Replacement to Willis Kerr's, Will, I'm sorry, Willis Kerr Contract Limited in the amount of $702,816.08 plus HST, and that Council authorizes Director of Public Works and the Mayor to enter into agreement to provide the services contained with this award. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So Jacob Consulting Canada Inc. Is an, uh, has conducted the detailed design and we issued the tender for this project and we received three bids. Uh, Willis Kerr Contracting Limited submitted the lowest bid. Uh, the bid came in significantly lower than the uh, estimated budget amount um, as the staff and the consultant worked through the design, detailed design efficiencies. Um, so it, this report is to see council approval to award the uh, the contract to the lowest uh, bidder here. Uh, the the savings between the um, the lowest bid and the approved budget will be utilized uh, towards uh, uh, Jacobs Consulting Canada Inc. as uh, we uh, split the their detailed design cost between 2021 and 2022. So uh, the the most of the savings will be utilized towards uh, paying the Jacobs uh, detail design fees and take them through the detail through the contract administration and inspection services. Again, we will continue to work with Jacobs to find further efficiencies, and any efficiencies we find will also can be uh, used towards any contingencies for any unforeseen 
uh, work that we see are on site. So, uh, so overall, there is we do not so anticipate uh, um, any impacts uh, beyond what is approved as part of 2022 budget. <coughs> Questions, comments from Mr. Tunio, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Mr. Tunio, but just doing my quick math. Am I, am I correct in once we pay Jacobs and, and with the savings that are there, there's still in and around $100,000 left over for your contingency plans? Is that around the right number? Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Good. Thank you. Mr. Tunio, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Thank you, We've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, seconded by Council Bergeron, that Council approve Budget Amendment 2022-09, that Council approves the award of RFQ PW 2022-05 for the removal and replacement of sidewalks in Winchester Village to Timson, Timson Paving and Concrete in the amount of $51,642 plus HST, and that Council authorize Director of Public Works and the Mayor to enter into the associated agreement. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So this uh, report seek Council approval to award the sidewalk um, reconstruction replacement at various locations to Timson, Timson Paving and Concrete in the amount of 51,642 plus HST. Uh, we are, when we release the tender, we release the tender based on what we anticipated in the work in 2021 and what we foresee, what also what we observed in 2022 through the winter. Uh, so we went uh, with a uh, little higher quantities and, and as anticipated, the bid came higher than the budgeted amount. Uh, so we have uh, basically identified what, what needs to be done as a minimum. Uh, we have reduced uh, the scope of work and the reduced the scope of work is in the amount of 51,642 plus HST. And uh, that is slightly ab ab uh, over the uh, budget and um, the difference will be funded through the 2021 budget surplus. Thank you. Questions, comments for Mr. Tunio? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Moved by Councillor Bergeron, second by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, the Council approves budget amendment number 2022-11 in the amount of $25,700 to extend the contract with Neptune Security Services in the amount of $26,425 plus HST for the supply and application of crack sealant on various roads within the Township of North Dundas. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So earlier this year, con Council approved uh, the crack sealing contract to Neptune Security Services Inc. Uh, in the amount of um, 26,425 plus HST. Um, that work was done last, uh, I think last in last week, week or so. Um, and, uh, and the anticipated uh, amount, crack ceiling we anticipated um, based on the sections of the road, um, that quantity of amount of crack ceiling was done in a, for a very smaller sections of the roadway. So we, the contractor identified, um, uh, end up doing more crack ceiling per section of the roadway than the anticipated amount. So we are coming back to the council for additional funds in the same amount. Um, the price uh, is good. It's get done through the STG contract and tendering process. Uh, so we are seeking council approval to for an additional 26,425 plus HST. Um, and some of that can be funded through the the current budget. So the budget amendment is only for 25,700. And the hope, we are hoping that once the council approve this money, uh, we will be able to um, ask the contractor to come back and, um, and finish the work as they have moved on to different locations. Um, and should this contractor does not come back, but then at least uh, we have this funding approved uh, to, to hire someone else to complete uh, or at least continue on with the crack ceiling program that we initiated for 2022. It's part of the preventive maintenance plan, and this is the first year we are proactively doing preventive maintenance on the township roadways. Thank you. Questions, comments? 
Ms. Rutley? So if the contractor can't come back, would you be going out to tender then? Or how would you be awarding it then if the current contractor for the sixth day of the D tender isn't coming back? Uh, through, through the mayor, so um, we uh, we will be still be going back to the STG to see the who's the second lowest so second lowest bidder is, and we will be approaching them to to complete the job. Anything further? Thank you. We've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. Thank you, Mr. Tunio. Oh, public works. Bylaws. Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, second by Councilor Bergeron, that bylaw number 2022-55, authorizing the township to accept the proposal submitted by J.L. Richards and Associates, Associates Limited to provide hydraulic water and wastewater modeling work to development applications using the township's existing hydraulic models, along with professional assistance as needed and requested, be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June, 2022. Mr. Tunio. Uh, thank you. So, GL Richard uh, is currently our uh, design consultant on various projects. They also have been and have developed township models for water and waste water hydraulic analysis. So, this is, we have been uh, sending the request from development community as 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 we receive the application for any new development. Uh, so for the GL Richard to do the analysis um, of how this development will have an impact on the at the connection point, will have, will our sewers be uh, sufficient enough and the water sufficient enough to accommodate the flows from the new development? So they have been retained um, by the development community um, through the township, uh, and they pay for the fees for those analysis. So what we are doing through this um, bylaw is uh, formalizing the arrangement between GL Richard and the township, and they will be retained as a, as this will be done as a standing agreement, and they will be retained as our standing uh, contractor, uh, consultant, to undertake uh, these type of assessments as the, as the development application comes in. There is no financial impact as in the past, the, the assessment, will be paid uh, by directly by the development community for their applications uh, and as part of review and approval process. So there is an agreement. Um, uh, bylaw is prepared. The jail Richard has a proposal submitted. Staff have reviewed it, and that requires some approval sign-off. And uh, the bylaw authorizes the, the mayor and the CEO to sign this uh, proposal. Questions, comments? Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just curious uh, if there's anything in place. Uh, I didn't, uh, I'll be honest, I mean, I didn't read all of it as, as intensely as I normally would, but I do understand that, um, I mean, to be very plain, J.L. Richards has been quite competent, but they have not exactly been timely, in my opinion. Uh, some things have dragged on longer. I do see that they have that their scope of work and, and promises are that they would provide our boundary uh, hydraulic information within 10 business days. Are there any penalties or is there, are there any checks and balances to make sure that JL Richards is in fact timely? What happens if they go past the 10 days? Because in, in my mind through, through JL Richards' fault and, and delays, there have been other reports that have taken quite a lot longer than, than in my personal opinion than they should have. So I, I would hope that we have something in place that would be hold them accountable if they go over the 10 business days that they promised. Are there, in fact, any penalties or anything in place? Uh, not, not in this uh, current proposal, but something we can we can go back and um, work on it and add something. Thank you. It's uh, for council. I mean, that would just be my personal opinion, but I do believe that they, and, and you know. With other projects as well, they, they, they again, I, I will say, JL Richards has been very competent, but not exactly timely in, in all aspects. So I would, I would, I would think it would behoove council to uh, to think about, if not outright penalties, at least some sort of enforcement possibilities. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, 
questions, comments, uh, thoughts on the deputy mayor's thoughts? Councillor Thompson. Yeah, uh, if it's been an issue on other on other projects, then it wouldn't hurt to have something in, have a uh, whether it was put in, yeah, what, uh, as a penalty or just uh, that there was wording in uh, holding them holding them to it, to their uh, commitment. Thank you, Councillor Annabel. I agree with Deputy Mayor. It, it's, it's kind of a domino effect. If they're behind, it puts the next step behind, and so on. So no, there should be some kind of retribution of some kind. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Bergeron, please weigh in. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I think there's some direction there. Okay, yes. Um, shall I do, uh, yes, Ms. Riley. Uh, sure, we can we can revise this and bring it back. There's nothing, nothing holding us back from like uh, still we still are working with GL Richard on different reviews anyway. So okay, so we'll look for some revised wording on that for the uh, maybe the next meeting. Are we suggesting? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll I'll read this. Uh, I'll read this again. Moved by. Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong, second with Councillor Bergeron, that bylaw number 2022-55 authorizing the township to accept the proposal submitted by J.L. Riches and Associated Limited to provide the hydraulic water and wastewater modeling work to development applications using the township's existing hydraulic models along with professional assistance as needed and request to be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June 2022. All those seeking deferral? That's deferred. Fair enough, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Bergeron, seconded by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, that bylaw number 2022-56 being a bylaw to appoint Jamie Cheney as drainage superintendent be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June 2022. Mr. Tuniel. Uh, thank you. So uh, our planner, Daniel uh, Ward, uh, she has been uh, performing the drainage uh, superintendent duties. Uh, for the township um, and uh, um, now with the Jamie uh, with uh, all his training completed and certification completed so he can be he can also be appointed uh, uh, for the same position and well, our understand our under our approach will be that Jamie can can be mostly doing the site uh, work such as um, accessing the properties, doing inspections, meeting with the property owners, and Daniel Ward can be doing some internal paperwork, uh, pulling out the reports, and assisting um, Jamie and preparing the uh, preparing the like working on the, some estimates and bills and things like that. So that comp in combination, I think, uh, will work well uh, for those two. Um, staff and uh, uh, but through this bylaw uh, with a de with Jamie designated uh, as a drainage superintendent it allows him to access the uh, the private properties at the same time so we would like to have this de this dual role purposes to to create efficiencies expertise um, and uh, sharing of expertise and managing the workloads with respect to drainage issues, as you know, that we have a significant amount of drainage work lagging behind that needs to be brought up to speed. Thank you. Questions, comments? I think this is, uh, um, I, I would imagine, somewhat unique in, uh, in municipalities or in townships to have this opportunity to have two people qualified in the fashion that uh, Mr. Cheney and, uh, and uh, Ms. Ward are and I think it's uh, it, it's a benefit to us and uh, I look forward to uh, this seeing success with this uh, this opportunity of having two two trained individuals supporting as you say Mr. Tunio the struggles that we have with drainage in our community. Thank you. Uh, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. That's carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk.
Moved by Deputy Mayor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor Bergeron, that bylaw number 2022-58 being a bylaw to enter into an agreement to entering into an agreement to use information with IntelliVote Systems Inc. be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June 2022. Madam Clerk. Okay, the township has already entered into an agreement with IntelliVote Systems to manage our election for 2022. So this agreement allows IntelliVote to share information with MPAC to provide different materials for the election like the voter information letter and updating the voter list. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you. Mr. Pohl. Moved by Councillor Annabel, second by Councillor Thompson, that bylaw number 2022-45 being a site plan control bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into a site plan control agreement between the Township of North Dundas and Reem Khalif for a three-unit home be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June 2022. Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mayor Fraser. Essentially, this is just for a site plan for a three-unit multifamily home on Merkley Road. It's fairly straightforward. It's been prepared and accepted by the site plan control team, and they're waiting on a building permit application. This is part of that, so they can get uh, construction started. And they have done, they've got their permit already for the septic system, and they're currently doing uh, well uh, testing and well making sure that that works uh, for three units that the well can supply quality and quantity uh, for this proposed development. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, I'm looking forward to this going forward. Uh, not that I'm pushing it forward, but I'm looking forward to this opportunity in our community to see something of this type, which will serve uh, families well. And uh, again, an example of uh, progress or progressive thinking in North Dundas and uh, maybe an attractive, uh, an attractive uh, benefit to uh, coming to North Dundas. We've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you, Mr. Oh, oh one more. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Annabel, that bylaw number 2022-48 being a bylaw respecting construction, demolition, change of use, and inspection of buildings within the Township of North Dundas be amended as presented this 21st day of June 2022, Mr. Paul. Yeah, this is a bylaw amendment to the existing bylaw that was passed by Council at the last meeting. We noticed a few minor little errors as we're going through it. Jacob uh, was back from his training course and picked up on a few things that were missing in the bylaw. Um, Councillor Bergeron also picked up a missing W that dropped somewhere along the line in the bylaw. Uh, we'll get that corrected in the final version. Uh, so this is just cleaning up and that actual paragraph actually stops us having to come back to correct errors like this, uh, where it doesn't change the bylaw but corrects minor errors or omissions in a bylaw. So this essentially is just cleaning it up. Questions, comments, Councillor Bergeron? <laughs> We've heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Key information reports, Mr. Paul. Uh, so we have two uh, reports back to back for new ExploraNet towers in the township of North Dundas. They're expanding their uh, reach throughout the township to give us better internet service. So there's two towers proposed, one uh, just east of Moorwood. Um, and it's a 20, uh, excuse me, a 45 meter self-supporting communications tower uh, that they're looking to install and they're looking for council comments. If there's any comments on these applications, the first one is uh, in Moorwood. So that's the, I've put together what's there. It's zoned for agricultural uses. It is a permitted use. Uh, they will require a building permit. So these are kind of the things uh, that are required. Our bylaw does allow for uh, the rezoning or not for reasons, only for these types of uses on properties. Uh, and the residential dwellings are quite far away in this particular property, 235 metres away uh, to the closest uh, residential dwelling. And there is landscaping and buffering. Uh, if you turn two more pages up there, uh, Raina, you can see the tree uh, buffering that occurs in and around there uh, that help buffer the, uh, the tower from any adjacent residential uses. I just highlighted them in red there, the, the existing trees for council on that application. Uh, council has any can comments you, can you on back that one? a couple, please? Yeah, it's Tom McGregor's uh, farm. Mm. Okay. It'll be at the back of the farm area. At that green mark. Yep. Okay. Where, where the arrow's pointing. Yep. 
I don't miss a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if there's any council comments on this particular one. I have some comments on the next one. No, I'm questions, comments, uh, Mr. Paul? Uh, no. The next one, please. So the next one is on uh, Hyman Road. Uh, it's on the south side of the road itself. Uh, if you can flip to the next slide there, it kind of shows where the proposal is. That's the GPS marks. So that's where I use the little pin there as you put the GPS coordinates in, and that's where it comes up. There is a dwelling across the street. Uh, you can see the pool in the backyard. Uh, the proximity there is quite close. I did uh, do just a, a measurement off of Google uh, to get an idea where it is. It's approximately 45 meters or 148 feet away. Not a great distance, and these towers are 45 meters high. Uh, so yeah, this essentially the tower could fall and hit the house it's technically at 45, 45, it was to fall down. So my recommendation to council is maybe to ask uh, that this tower be pushed further back from Hyman Road so it doesn't have an opportunity to actually cross the road if it was to fall for whatever reason in a, a big storm or something happens, um, to push it back further from the road so there's no possibility of it hitting uh, anything if it was ever to fall. I'm just, uh, for my benefit, if that pin was to drop straight down, would that be interfering with, is there uh, development or housing? The closest house is, uh, you can see a little blue mark there, that's the pool, and just to the drop down below it right there is the house itself, no, a little higher. Oh, but I'm talking about the pin, if the pin was to drop. <clears throat> oh, there's nothing there, that's just a field, or a treed area, a forested area, where they're planning to put it in. Uh, questions, comments from other members of council? Councillor Bergeron, then Deputy Mayor. Mr. Paul, I just wondered, is the section saying that the normal distance would be five, like is there a rule about normal distance to a, to a, a, a house? Yeah, that's controlled by the uh, CRTC. Yeah. They control all those kind of things. I, We contract this out to, uh, what do we call it, the Canadian? Oh, what's his wrong name? Canadian Radio Communications Information and Notification Service. So they they are our guide, and they have all that information uh, as far as what the minimum setbacks are. Uh, we dealt with one of these with Rogers out on south of Chesterville a couple of years back now, and we had them also move the tower further back from the road. That was a Rogers tower. Uh, we had concerns over that one with regard to wind, and the same kind of applies here. If it builds up with ice on it, and like we had during the ice storm, and the wind takes that off, as it starts to melt, that ice can fall on the road. That was a county road, so we were trying to push them back further so no ice would fall on the county road. Same kind of applies, it would apply here. Uh, they were trying to do the exact same kind of idea with a big tower, and that one was a bit higher, but uh, probably twice what this one is. Um, so that's another factor, too, to make sure because the wind would probably push any ice that was falling off onto Hyman Road and potentially risk damage to vehicles or people if they're walking there. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I think, uh, well, two things. Um, I'm fully in favor of anything that that uh, uh, this is this is why we decided to to become a, a member of, of the Crins and and uh, back when we did, and um, anything that's going to move this along. I know there's there's you know there's another um, uh, group and institution that's been long working and you know promises and promises but my internet speed hasn't changed anything it certainly hasn't changed in the township so perhaps we could take a little less than the 150 odd million dollars that has somewhere gone in the last 20 years and, and get some companies like this that'll put up some towers because at the end of the day our constituents don't care who's done it whether they're a very celebrated group or or just a group like this that is is going for capitalism at its finest and i think that's great uh as far as your recommendation that, that we send along with it to move it back. I think it's just prudent. Well, as you said, we did it once before, and we should just do it again, and uh, and and hopefully encourage more to uh, to go ahead and put towers up. Thank you, and thank you for the comments. Yeah, I think we'll follow the uh, your suggestion, Mr. Paul, and the your past practices of making uh, people comfortable. Right. Thank you. Mr. Grow, your report on finance. Good 
Good evening again. Um, yes, I have a KIR here. We prepare an annual report for council detailing the annual surplus or deficit by department. And as I mentioned when I was up here a little bit earlier, earlier we have an overall surplus this year of $472,300.27. It's detailed in appendix number one. So a um, couple of options are we could, we well, first thing is bullet point number one. Some of the surplus has already been appropriated in the 2022 budget, so that's detailed in Appendix 2, so cover that off in a second. The balance could be used to finance on finance capital projects from previous years. It could be transferred to general working funds reserves. It could be transferred to the various departments in the ratio that it, that it appears or any other project that the council deems uh, worthy. But if you go to Appendix 2, which is on page 283, um, you'll see that the surplus of 472,300 has already been appropriated by 169,912, and that consists of um, some projects committed by department, fire services, refurbishing a combination tool, $6,000, <coughs> station three, port -a tank rack, 3398, and in transportation, we have gravel maintenance, um, a loader, crack ceiling, transportation backhoe, and a one-ton truck. Um, 45,000 and 10,009 respectively. And in recreation, the building needs study was over budget by 88.25. So that's where the 169.912 went. On appendix one, page 284, thank you, is a breakdown by department. So every department uh, ended with a, some cases a small surplus and some instances a bit larger, but general government 18.9, economic development 14.4, Fire services is very pluses and minuses, but um, they ended with 40,649 in total. Planning and building, a surplus of 147,366. Public works, including drainage, was a surplus of 43,514. Recreation and culture, including other facilities, was a surplus of 169,028. And waste management was a surplus of 38,400 for an overall surplus of 472,300. That's further explained on the next uh, three pages. And I don't know how much council wants to get into this tonight or if you wanna wait till the next meeting to decide, but just so you know what this is all about, page 285 uh, breaks down those departmental um, surpluses on a, on a bit more granular level. So general government, for example, 18.9 surplus comes from supplementary taxes, uh, was actually less than what was budgeted, but investment income was higher by 33,000. Insurance recoveries were um, we had budgeted for, so we got 12,000 there. Council conference expenses were down by 14. Professional fees were over budget by 55. And um, SOE direct costs, we had, there was a savings of 25. So. That kind of thing continues on by department. So I'm not going to go through it line by line like that unless council wants me to, okay? And uh, you guys, I'm uh, sorry, council can take it home and look at it and let us know um, at a future meeting what you would like us to do with the balance. Thank you, Mr. Groh. Thank you. Comments, questions for, for Mr. Groh before he gets away? Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Madam CAO. Yes. Just, I know there's some department heads have some other things, so perhaps we could bring a report to council with some other things to consider of where there's some spots that they could bring some things to, to council's attention, possible places to spend some. I think that'd be a good idea. I have some thoughts too. Good move. I'm sure we all do. So everyone heard uh, the presentation earlier tonight, and I don't know if council's at a, a position right now in terms of deciding next steps or whether you want some time to ask some more questions. Um, as Mr. Barros explained tonight, that we can look at um, which buildings, if any, we would be interested in having him do his analysis on. He would determine eligibility, work up a proposal from there. So I don't know if, if council wants some time to think about this some more or whether you want us to work on a list. Um, this is just an opportunity if you're ready to, to give any direction on the potential for looking into uh, the project as proposed by Mr. Barrows. Well, just to give it a, a quick thought on it before I open up the rest of council. Uh, a quick thought before I open up the rest of council is that uh, this all stemmed uh, from uh, discussion uh, 
that was out there about the uh, the roof on the uh, Sam Alt Arena, and uh, and uh, as as was stated, Mayor McGillis from South Stormont uh, had heard of that conversation and uh, brought this to uh, to my attention. I'm not sure if he spoke to the deputy mayor at the time, but he brought. Uh, no, it's not, but I actually just sorry, but just yesterday. Okay, and so it brought it to uh, my attention and just most recently to the deputy mayor's attention of of, uh, of this process. So we've had an opportunity to look at some of the package. We've had an opportunity to hear Mr. Barrows. Uh, there was good questions asked, and I'm sure there's more to be asked. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview of how we got to this point in the conversation. But I'll open up the council for uh, response to CAO. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, uh, how would I say? Uh, in speaking with with uh, Mayor McGillis, uh, it certainly sounds a, a very positive thing. Uh, to the point of question that the Councillor Thompson asked, uh, which I think I deciphered the answer that 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 Mr. Barrows gave, uh, in that we would have no real risk of cost or anything if if he's going to look at it. So that certainly. Uh, massages any concerns that I would have since we wouldn't, we, you know, you're not in for a pound and out for a, a real beating. It would be interesting to see it. I will say at, at the public table with you two gentlemen sitting here, the one thing from a, from a very higher level and not having it really deeply explained to me, I will probably always carry a little discomfort when it comes to solar panels uh, concerning our fire department, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to know that that's just me being scared of the boogeyman, or if it's real, but I know that we certainly have discussed it, you guys have lived it, that there are some unknowns about fire, and, and it does, uh, I'm not saying that it would ever get me to raise my hand to say no, I mean, I know that there's competent people and, and you have a, a consultant like this looking at it, and then you have engineers that are way more attuned to it than, than I am, but it, it will always be a concern when we start putting them up on public buildings for our volunteers. Um. Not, it's not a debate, uh, but yeah, the concern, and uh, I know Councillor Thompson uh, has expressed that too as well. Like, uh, and uh, I think you might remember back in the day when I was pounding a table about how do we deal with this, and there's no no good there is there wasn't a, an answer delivered by this professionals. Thing, there's still never been. There's an still not a good question. answer delivered to how we best do that, except for uh, as I was joking with someone, and it's not a joke. Uh, the rule of thumb. Uh, that's how you'd uh, manage the safety and the risk in that, and uh, and that that's I guess the best answer we have so far is to stand back and, uh, and don't jeopardize yourself with one of with a fire on a solar on a on a building covered with solar panels. And if but I may, Mr. Mayor, just to be clear, I, I mean I'm not saying that to be a naysayer. I just I wouldn't be comfortable with myself if I didn't say it. At the of course, table because of course. we have men and women that are have to deal with it afterwards and, and, and to the mayor's point, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say it's over 10 years ago that he asked a very pointed question of the people that should have had the answer and to date we have not had the answer. So again, that's not meaning I, I'd be waiting to raise my hand to say no, it's mm -hmm. just a concern. No, it's something that has to be has to be said, I understand that. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, that was, that was at least 10 years ago that question was uh, answered or was asked by the, uh, by the fire departments and uh, and there was, uh, I believe, there was training promised, and there was uh, nothing. Nothing came through with it. So it's, I think, it's something that should be asked again. See if there's uh, anything current or any, any answers for it. But for as far as looking into it, I think we should give. Uh, um, with the commitment we got, uh, there's no apparently no risk. It almost sounds too good to be, yeah. too good to be true. Yeah. A presentation like that with uh, no financial. Uh, risk until we uh, until we look at the proposal and see if it's something we want to go forward with. So I think we should look into it. Thank you for your comment, uh, Councillor Annabel. No, I agree as well. I think it, it's it's an opportunity to explore and uh, I think we should give it an inquiry for sure. Councillor Bergeron. Right, so we reached out to the insurance company and we have to fill out an application once we have the specifics. They 
um, gave us a sheet with some some tidbits. But in terms of any impact on premium or any concerns, until we give them the details and apply, we couldn't get any further information. And on the fire question, I will certainly ask. And, and uh, bearing in mind that uh, I believe that's only 30% of the savings can come from solar panels, so there'll be savings to be had elsewhere. And there's the, uh, n not that I'm, just that I had the opportunity to listen to Mr. Barrows uh, twice now, um, the opportunity to look at all of our buildings and to prioritize our buildings and to, s to see what if, where we can best take advantage of of the opportunity that's presented to us, uh, be it uh, at maybe some of our fire halls for improving efficiencies or um, even uh, the arena in Chesterville may may offer opportunity for efficiencies and savings. So there's, uh, with the number of facilities that our Recreation and Culture Department have, I think there's opportunity to look at and prioritize uh, to get to a point where we can uh, present to Mr. Barrows uh, our, our thoughts and uh, have them take a look. So would you like staff to come back to council with the list of buildings we're considering or would you like us to come up with a list of buildings and get Mr. Barros to give us like a proposal like, to get the pre determination? I, I think it'd be uh, um, best if you uh, had a list of buildings prioritized, mm -hmm. uh, presented to staff, uh, or not to staff, presented to council. Uh, to maybe refresh our memories or, or, or remind us of things we may have forgotten about or buildings we not have considered before we go to Mr. Barrows. Okay. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> before I read the consent agenda, um, resolution, does any, do any department heads have anything they want to add? Mr. Paul. Um, 424 today. Uh, so our official plan is in place right now, the Schedule A-1, which is the land use schedule that Council discussed earlier. The settlement was accepted by the, the Ontario Land Tribunal. Get the new name, they keep switching names on me every so many years. Uh, months nowadays. Uh, the other part of it was there was a golf course, South Mountain, or excuse me, Sandy Row Golf Course and Restaurant, and the strip outside of <clears throat> South Mountain. They weren't included in the decision. They're in the write-up to the decision, but they're not in the actual decision itself, the order. So I've just uh, emailed during the meeting to the county planner, and he's directed the uh, Stephen Alt and uh, Josh Moon, who's uh, the solicitor, for the counties to make sure that those two get brought into the decision or are we looking at an official plan amendment to clean that up so we're trying to get that because he has it in the body of it but he didn't have it in the actual order at the end of the document so he talked about it and said yeah we're all accepting that but it didn't end up in the final text so we're just going back and forth to get that in so effectively the decision's made for the mapping so the mapping's done uh, but for those two areas until that order is revised those two are on hold uh, until that's taken care of but we finally have a schedule and an official plan we can move forward with. Thank Effective you. today at 424. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Th just to be clear, so that strip in South Mountain, is that is that the strip on the south side west of the former Jet Express further down, or is, is that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it extends from South Mountain all the way along okay. the river past Jet Express. Yeah, okay. It Good. includes that whole strip. Okay. Uh, for some reason, it got left off of. So the they are it, the the assumption is that they they are going to approve the 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 change of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He had indicated in the text we we're approving this, but it wasn't in the final order that actually. So they changed because you and I had spoken about that yep. a month ago, and they they were holding firm to no, but they've changed. I think no? if I may interrupt you, I think we need a little bit more clarity on that because you know what you're talking about, and I think we all know what we're talking about, but yes. more than just us. So mm -hmm. it was, it was established to be agriculture, correct? That's and the argument was to get it back to rural. Yes. And this is what you are discussing right. with yeah, Mr. We Ball. didn't, or we through through Calvin did not. We did not ask for the agriculture designation. That's the change that the province made. Right. And the and the argument was to get it to rural or back to rural. Right. Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. I and just want to make sure because if there's yeah, anyone sorry. out there. Sorry. Sorry. I should have been more specific. Yeah. And just for any clarity that people uh, that are unaware of that area, that area is 
rife with agricultural operations and the people in that strip have agricultural backgrounds, they would clearly be using it for an agricultural purpose if it was usable, mm -hmm. um, which is what the argument was, right? It's it, not usable. <laughs> none of the farmers that live on it are farming it because it's <laughs> underwater and they well, haven't yet been able to. Narrow, yeah. a piece of equipment but couldn't even turn around somebody in Queen's Park felt that perhaps you should be better at uh, farming water. <laughs> um, anything further from Mr. Paul on that nice announcement? So if I can have, offer clarification. So we fought to get rural. They wanted an agriculture. So the settlement is back to what it was in 2006, which is a special policy area that recognizes what's there, allows for certain commercial and other activities to occur on it, like Jet Express and other things to occur on it. So we're going back to the 2006 decision, and that's what's going to go back down for now. And we're going to continue to try and get that to rule. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. So that's, that up. that's, that's, that's important that we get it right. But so it still gives uh, it gives us more autonomy than we yes. have. Yeah, absolutely. Without it, yeah. I mean, there can be special exemptions. And, uh, yeah. Good. Well, con congratulations and all you and uh, thank you for all your efforts to get to this point. Um, I guess the the workload will lighten up a little bit, mm -hmm. but. It's going to increase. We'll find something else. <laughs> I'm sure. And, uh, no, but this, it's been a long battle, I know, and an expensive battle, and an expensive battle and struggle. Uh, I'll steal some thunder from someone, but an expensive battle, uh, unnecessary. Yeah. And uh, as you say, the 2006 decision, uh, we're going hopefully back to that, that one. Uh, on this case of the strip of land, um, it's, it's, it was... Uh, Incredible. Whenever I, I think uh, the the number of times that Deputy Mayor and I listen to uh, lawyers speak on this, and the expense incurred at that that we only saw lightly, but uh, thank you once again for all your efforts. Yep. Boards and committees, County Council, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple of the highlights. Uh, a couple, of, well, one RIP success oh, story. Me. Mm -hmm. I have to stop you. This is part of the consent agenda. I didn't. Uh, All right. Moved by Councillor Annabelle, second by Councillor Thompson, that Council authorized payment of accounts as per the attached Council report dated May 1st, 2022 to May 16th, 2022, batch 50 to 54, in the amount of $397,434.13. And May 17, 2022 to May 31st, 2022, batch 55 to 62 in the amount of $3,315,470.92. And then all other items listed under the consent agenda be approved as recommended. We all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None? Carried. Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you. Uh, an RIP success uh, announcement. The Winchester Crew and Club has received their funding for or will be receiving funding in $9,580 for improvements in in, uh, in their club. Um, there were six other awards put out, n none in North Dundas, but well situated throughout the SD&G. Uh, just a note to anybody at council or anybody in staff or any, anyone that knows someone in North Dundas that might, that, that you think might be a proper application for the next round of RIP, and I believe the final one for 2022, there should be in excess of $200,000 available. I think uh, I may even be a little light on that number because they'll accumulate, they'll add up all of the uh, parts, the numbers that weren't given out. Uh, but I know, I know I'm confident saying at least 200K will be available. So this would be the last time. There was a uh, surprise announcement. Um, Tim Simpson uh, tendered his retirement papers, effective December 31st, 2022. Um, he, he felt it was time. I, I feel he just couldn't live without me, so he's yeah. going to leave when I'm going to leave. Um, uh, but it's, he will be sorely missed. He, he certainly, uh, I, I said it then, uh, just in the four years that we've gotten to know him a little bit better, um, I believe he changed uh, some attitudes around the counties and, and brought it into a, a new era, and, and I think that his, his work is, uh, w will acquit him very well. For posterity, and I think that the search for a new CAO will be uh, will be put into some pretty big hands. Um, but it was a shock. No one, at, no one at the table knew. There was not one person who, who knew. So, uh, but he just felt it was time. Um, one thing that, that that was discussed, and certainly our CAO would be very attuned to it, and probably better to speak at it than than I am. But I would, uh, 
I would suggest the councils going forward that one thing that the, since it's been identified by the warden's caucus and by county council, by this council, as one of the big uh, agenda items for, for all of our townships, being affordable housing, the affordable housing working group, which uh, Angela would obviously know very well, but that that discussion was had and, and talking about it, and and I think really going forward, if possible, I I haven't looked. I don't even know if we have applicable lands, but if North Dundas has an interest in in trying to find and do what they can as a council to find areas where affordable housing would be appropriate, um, you need to be forward thinking on it because this this group and 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 the city that that is controlling really the the purse strings are going to need shovel ready properties when funding capabilities come along yeah we've seen it in in just the timing uh with south dundas and the wonderful announcement that they had but had they not had that property through whatever man manner uh prepared then that would have gone elsewhere or perhaps not been done it's the same way the one that on pitt street for uh, I think 90 some odd units, um, they just they just had the property. So I know no, we don't have any in our possession, but we, you know it's something if you do identify it as a problem, you're gonna wanna you're gonna want to be prepared because again, it's Ontario wide and it's and it's a problem, but if you don't have any property, you're not going to get into the game. Um, and other than that, there wasn't really um, yeah, there was nothing really overly significant. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll touch base with the Canada Day. It's uh, Canada Day's upcoming. It's uh, obviously July 1st, but it'll be July, held on July 1st at the uh, the uh, Mountain Township Ag Society Fairgrounds in South Mountain. It's uh, free. It starts at 3 p.m. There will be fireworks at dark uh, and lots of activities, music, activities, and tickets are available for a barbecue chicken dinner. And um, I'm sure if you check our website or the Mountain Township Ag Society's uh, Facebook page, you'll find uh, this information and much more. But I'm looking forward to the, uh, the event on July 1st in South Mountain. Um, the cake has been ordered. <laughs> Serving cake at five. And so the deputy mayor will be once again doing his duty, making sure the cake arrives safely and untouched. Well tested. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, yes, it's going to be an exciting uh, and the, the weather. I'm I'm promising to be nice. And nothing to uh, talk about on display of lights, fire steering uh, we committee. Had a meeting. There's been no meeting. Um, did we touch base, uh, Councillor Thompson, on the success of Art in the Waterfront? We no. did already. Uh, yes, last week we Thank talked you. about it, and as we had a, we had a wrap up meeting last night, and they wanted me to extend uh, thanks to the township. They said uh, the recreation department and roads department setting up the uh, barricades, um, just helping with the cleanup on the garbage. They said that it was uh, second to none the help that they got. So they wanted to extend the thanks to everyone in the township for for the work they did, and they're looking forward to next year. And well, Cheryl uh, Beasley was the uh, chair of it. She's uh, stepping down. She's going to stay on the committee, but she's stepping down as chair for uh, for next year's uh, next year's event. Well, please extend on our behalf to uh, Cheryl our thanks for uh, starting that project and uh, seeing it forward and making sure it survived through the pandemic. Uh, her efforts uh, need to be heralded and appreciated by all because they've. Uh, it really is exemplary. Another uh, volunteer in our community that does fantastic work. I'll let her know. The Historical Society, I'm, I'm feeling like deja vu. Yeah. <laughs> with there's, no, with there's nothing. Nothing, uh, nothing, nothing. Nothing new on them. Dairy Fest is coming up, Councillor Bergeron. Yeah, I have nothing new either. Nothing new? It's, well, it's going to happen. I just don't have anything new. Okay. Check our website. Check the, the Dairy Fest uh, Facebook page. There's well, lots of information there as well. Councillor Hannibal. Uh, we haven't had a meeting per se, but we're just praying for rain-free night for bike night, and we're ready to roll. <coughs> Thank you. Motions, notices of motions, none. Uh, petitions, um, I guess we received something tonight from the, uh, was that a petition or information package? From the Hallville group. Um, council comments and concerns.
uh, I have a couple of things in front of me. Uh, one, um, I know there's some uh, other uh, other information to come forward, but this is about Mr. F uh, Kenny Froats. It is from the Association of Ontario Road Supervisors. I've been remiss. I haven't uh, made this announcement earlier. It came to me in April, and uh, it kept slipping underneath pink sheets here. Uh, but uh, Mr. Froats, uh, Kenny, or Ken, as uh, he's known by some, has received his Associate Road Supervisor Certificate uh, from AORS. And, um, and AORS uh, in, are celebrating it as well, and they're asking that we publicly acknowledge this achievement, and uh, I think it's achievements like this uh, when our employees uh, go out and achieve uh, uh, certification, higher levels of certification that serve the public and serve us, uh, need to be acknowledged and celebrated. And uh, so uh, congratulations to uh, Ken Froats for uh, achieving the Associate Road Supervisor Certificate. I'm sure it's going to serve Mr. Tunio well. Other notices. In the building department, Jason Forget. Uh, not to be confused with our CBO, Jacob Forget, has uh, recently completed his uh, OBOA training course uh, for inspection of houses, and that's going to be a good complement to our planning, building, and enforcement division. As well, uh, the last one, uh, Nick Hubble. Nick Hubble's name gets mentioned uh, seemingly quite often for his achievements, and uh, he has taken the health and safety part two and completed his IMS 200 course. And these requirements uh, ensure that he's able to uh, take on the role of uh, CEMC, Community Emergency Management Coordinator role. Uh, it's an important role that's recognized by the OFMEM, and uh, it helps us prepare for emergencies in our community. And uh, congratulations to Nick for achieving that, and again, uh, supporting what goes on in North Dundas. Anything else from anyone? Move by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Annable, that bylaw number 2022-59 to adopt, to adopt, confirm, and ratify matters dealt with by resolution be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 21st day of June 2022. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Annable, second by Councillor Thompson. The council adjourn at 9.05 p.m. to the call of the chair. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience and this evening, and I look forward to our next meeting.